Are any people, have you submitted? You're already presenting tonight? All right, so as Rolika mentioned, make sure that uh, the presentation is given to the tech team. Uh, not now, maybe a little later. We, we're starting a little late, so no problem. And please make sure, people who are participating, to make sure that one of the important uh, criteria for judges is time. So you need to make sure that you time yourself, stick to the time, because you lose, time, you lose marks if you don't stick to uh, a five minutes time. How's the day going so far? Is it too long? Is it tiring? Is it too draining or it's energizing? Did you, did you feel that you know a lot of things or you feel that you don't know stuff? How is it? What, what do you think? Is, is, it, is it okay? I mean, you felt uh, that some knowledge was transferred or it's too draining? Well, what suggestion? Do you think we should just end at 4 o'clock? <laughs> uh, one time we, when, when he asked for feedback in Hyderabad around five years ago, that is the first suggestion almost 60% of them gave. That close the, the eye focus at four o'clock so that we can all go home and have biryani. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, as you, you know, it, it has evolved over a period of last nine years. A lot of times we did think about ending it fast, but we realized that a lot of topics which uh, we covered this way could not be covered if we truncate the timing. So that's the reason why we, we keep it going. And uh, as you said, we are we're quite lenient. We let you go and come as you want, and that way you can recharge your batteries. How many of you are, are from Delhi in, in this? Oh, so a lot of you are from outside Delhi. How many of you are from government medical colleges? Oh, and how many of you are DNB? Anybody writing FRCS in this year, 2023? Because we have uh, ICO FRCS modules, we have, uh, apart from ICO, there is a new organization called IOFF. So we're going to talk about that as well. It is giving a similar kind of help to people uh, who, which ICO used to give. Now we have our uh, luminaries here back and we'll be starting the session soon. We'll, I'll ask uh, Rolika to invite uh, our, uh, our uh, senior consultants and introduce them. So back, back after a little break. Okay, so we will be going on with our next session and that will be the Cornea 3 session. And we have with us our chairs for the evening, Dr. Rishi Mohan sir and Dr. Ritu Arora ma'am. I request them to please come over the stage. And our first speaker for this session is Dr. J.K.S. Parehar, the senior consultant and the head of academics and training, CFS Delhi, with an expertise in refractive eye surgery. He has served in the armed forces for over 34 years with distinction and attained the rank of major general as well. So that is the second uh, highest rank for any doctor in the Indian armed forces. So welcome, sir. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I can't say ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, children. <laughs> and uh, I know these classes are too taxing, toxic. That is a general feeling in mind when you attend this. One after another since 7 o'clock to 6 o'clock, yes, you need a little. So what I expect, it should be a nano teaching type. Nano from my side and Nano adopted by you. So one has to be focused what is expected during exam and for your practice as well as general awareness and rather going into the too much details of uh, organic uh, chemistry and biochemistry etc. in a common preservative media. I think that will be too much. You won't be able to remember and what the examiner asks the questions, he doesn't know what is the answer for it. So obviously don't ask me any question because I don't need the answer for anything. I can only talk. Now, word about uh, 
global burden of uh, corneal blindness. When we talk about the blindness, yes, it can be the blindness due to the eye, it can be blindness, the cortical blindness, and blindness of the mindset and thought process. So I am restricting myself to the corneal blindness. I need not to spell it out here, what is cornea? You may be laughing, but I have seen PGs in examinations, they were not able to tell me the five layers of the cornea. So if we go with the uh, exact how many people are means suffering from the blindness, what is blindness? As per the WHO, the vision is less than less, uh, 660. And uh, uh, if it is economic, then uh, it may be even 360 may be considered as a different uh, aspect. So both are there, 360, 660. But with the present, uh, even if somebody is having 624, it may be considered as a blindness with the modern style of the functioning and if he has been with the software and other details. And this is one of the world's uh, leading cause of avoidable blindness. Most who are having the corneal blind, they live in a low and middle income countries and that too in the low socioeconomic group except the cases of keratoconus, those have gone into the advanced stage and that number is gradually reducing with the awareness and thank to the byproduct of the refractive laser procedures, we are able to diagnose them well in advance. This is a report from the 100 odd countries that how these are the indications and here you see that the pattern is different and our country it goes with the injuries and infectious one so the and yes, the bullous keratopathy has lowered down. When I was operating uh, initially in, uh, soon after my FECO training in 90s, probably we have contributed tremendously in the bullous keratopathies. But my next generations are much better than, and I am sure you are much, much better than me. And uh, this uh, is taken a back step now. This is about the supply and demand of the corneal transplantation in the 143 countries just for the common interest. What is exact number in our country? Very difficult to know. I don't know how many money in coins in my pocket. I don't know. Probably there is nothing except the few. The same way here, we don't have the 140 uh, crores populations, a proper survey with the exact all all districts are more than 800 districts of the all areas. It is very extremely difficult. So this is, exp uh, it is around uh, 7 million with the vision less than 660 and one of the, this almost 1 million or maybe more with the bilateral one. It means we need at least 10% keratoplasty. And as we all know that getting the good cornea in our country, tropical countries and other issues is difficult. And any, uh, you accept the cases of corneal dystrophy where the corneal transplant uh, has a, a good uh, optical outcome after 10 to 15 years, most of the corneal transplant, what type of cases we get are hardly for three to five years and they may need re-PK also. So that is why we have, these are the causes of the different causes and I make an interruption here that why this talk is so important because it is for the eye banking purpose one, then I want to generate interest on the, for academic part also that other than corneal blindness, NSVB programs and medical legal aspects, corneal transplant act, these all are very, very important for you to know for your examination as well as for the subsequent practice also. If we go a little back on the historical background of the corneal transplant, it has started in 1944-45, and this is the Chennai uh, Agmore Hospital. If we go with the, uh, at the international level, this uh, Conard Zerm, and it, he is the person who had uh, uh, did the initial work for all of us. These all are readily available, so I am not taking too much time, but yes, history, should be kept in the mind because it is very, very important to link with the system. And in New York, it was in 1937. So if New York was 1937, the Chennai people in 1944 was not very far off. Uh, Dr. Ritu will bear with me because when the corneal transplant, when I saw it, it was going with the split suture of the 7-0 suture. Won't believe that that the corneal transplant was done with the no visco, no microscope, with the 7-0 suture, split it with the 
uh, silk suture, then it came the 8-0, 9-0, 10-0, and we have gone up to the 13-0 with so much advancement in the technologies. So our first corneal transplant was happened in 1948. Dr. R.E.S. Muthaiya established the nation's first eye bank in 1945 in the Chennai Regional Institute of Ophthalmology. And that the journey starts from this point. About the eye banking, yes, it has started in 1961. Though we started uh, practicing uh, transplant since the uh, 40s, but the first uh, formal eye bank, uh, the association and the banks were founded quite late. So this is the journey of the eye banking in our country, how it has gone, EVI. Uh, incidentally, I have the responsibility to lead the EVI right now, was uh, founded in 1989. And Dr. R.P. Nanda from my college, MGM Medical Indore, was the first president of this society. This is the journey about the eye banking in our country, how it has gone. And uh, this 1994 has a transplantation of Human Organ Act, which has come, and then it has a subsequent amendments in the 2011. This entire journey had a break uh, during COVID time. COVID period was we were fighting to give the treatment for the life-saving treatment rather than going. Even on those days, though optical keratoplasty was not going on, but the IBank continues to work hard to get uh, cornea for therapeutic keratoplasty and uh, uh, some kind of uh, very interesting innovative research where have been done by our uh, prominent uh, leading ophthalmic uh, institutes in country on the COVID related and Dr. Ritu Arora who is sitting here as a Dean GNEC. She was also part of it. Madam, I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you, I'm not listening to you. I put so much money in your hand, you haven't listened to it. Now see this, I want to make it. The monotony is the biggest problem. Whether it is on the, off, on the che, dais or off the dais. So when it can happen here also, it can happen there also. And that is why I said, talk less and gain less, so that you can retain that. I was mentioning about the research and innovations during COVID time. And prominent uh, institutes in country, they have contributed tremendously. And one of them is uh, uh, Professor Ritu Arora, Dean GNAC was also involved with this. But Madam didn't respond. My all efforts have gone. I couldn't. I won't get di distinction. I know that. So what is the present scenario of I banking in our country? We have uh, around um, 760 institutional members, and uh, almost a thousand odd. Uh, we have the other members, and but surprisingly, only 15 I banks they contribute two percent of the 760 organizations. So, so we match with the. Uh, Indian uh, corporate setup, where the 85% uh, of the corporate business is held by only few uh, less than 20 houses. The same with I banking is also doing it. But I expect that the more and more people join corneal uh, transplant activities and perform more. What is our requirement here? At least uh, we should have uh, annually at least one lakh corneal transplants. And that is, uh, for that you need to have the 2,000, uh, two lakhs corneal collections as per the present type of the quality we get for the optical purpose. Uh, PK, you can't have more than 50 to 60 percent. But yes, now with the newer techniques of DALC and uh, DSEC, DMEC, definitely it has improved substantially and it has gone up to 72, 70 to 80 percent. South is always the best. Unfortunately, I am not from the South, but my color matches with them, so I can definitely monitor, um, uh, temper myself. One more, uh, this, that the South zone has a maximum, the Ch thanks to Chennai, Bangalore, and, uh, and uh, Hyderabad. Golden triangle of uh, ophthalmic activities in the country. Maximum contribution, it comes from there. These are the high-performing states. About the preservative media, this is very, very important that now we have got in our country, the cornisol has, now it has taken as gradually taking up the center spread in the eye banking. Uh, and it uh, goes, uh, you can use it for a very long time, optisol and all, uh, can, uh, you can preserve cornea up to 
two weeks, but I found that at least for 10 to uh, 7 to 12 days, the cornea remains very healthy and you can, it, it does not happen. Like if I have put on six decades of my life, it did, didn't take place in one day. Every time I have put on some brick on this. The same way here, if the cornea in the corneal preservative media, it won't be like uh, this that uh, your birthday is today and uh, to yesterday you were uh, 25 year old and suddenly at 11.55, 11.59 in the night you have become 26 year, no. Same way. So the cornea in the MK media, MK media is a standard preservative media and uh, you can keep it for up to seven days, but ideal time is up to 72 to 96 hours. The cornea remains very uh, healthy for uh, using for the optical purpose. And if you go back to the initial histories when we had uh, no access to the uh, this MK media all over the country, very few institutions like RP Center was making it and the Ramayana, LV Prasad, they were providing. And I remember my college days, uh, we had only moist chamber. We collected and then to do the keratoplasty immediately, as early as possible. And uh, believe me that I have also done three, four uh, keratoplasty the whole night doing because the cornea will go away. So now you can customize your, you can get the patients, you can call them from, uh, you can call them from uh, Trivandrum to even Srinagar, four hours they will reach there, so, and plan your OT. So this is definitely a better handling. And with the HIV which has uh, come in between, so preservative media has become very, very important to use it. And uh, if you long-term preservative, for optical purpose, it's a cryo uh, freezing like for other procedures in our, uh, done in the medicine, which is not so popular and expensive one, but yes, it can be kept there. And uh, uh, this uh, glycerol for a non-optical uh, purpose, you can keep the cornea there with the scleral rim also, and this cornea can be used for the uh, giving uh, this uh, restoration of any defects. It can be used for, other than the corneal transplant in some other cases also, the corneal tissue can be used and in cases of keratoconus, C3R, etc., we do club with that contact lens and with the, with the smile lenticule and uh, same way this preserved corneal tissue can also be taken care of in this. So there will be multiple uses by how, what should be the ideal uh, uh, eye banking. You, you need to have a system where you are able to evaluate the corneal tissue and a specular uh, microscope for the, there are two types of specular microscope, one for the live, uh, this for the seeing the eye and the second one is for the cadaveric purpose. So cadaveric specular is good to, uh, essential for as per the uh, THOA Act uh, ideal bank should have. Laminar uh, air flow, this is very, very important. So you need, you should have, and uh, for the taking the tissue, uh, you must uh, draw the blood, and that blood is being sent for uh, HIV and other related uh, investigations. You can have the separate containers for preservation. Now, there are certain issues related with the eye banking basically to get the cornea in time. And still uh, there are some thing is uh, lagging behind like in the, being the health is a state subject. Uh, handling the corneal registry, etc., for the corneal transplant and the eye banking is with the state. And most of the states, they do allow liberal activities in eye banking, but the Maharashtra restricts the transportation of the tissue from one, uh, one uh, from Maharashtra to other state. And uh, in the previous act, uh, it was the cornea was the part of the organ. And the second in 2011, when the amendment went, we got it to into convert it into the tissue, which has made even now the technician can take out the corneal tissue. Otherwise, it used to be the ophthalmologist is mandatory to get the uh, this thing. So these are the policy changes. Mandatory death notification that has also helped us to go f further with this. And this hospital cornea retrieval program, it has definitely improved the uh, outcome you are able to get. Like here, it is HR, HCRP, something like a eye focus. 
I got the 200 uh, plus PG. I am told 210 minus two, though two have already gone out. 208 are physically present and uh, I am sure at least 25 are mentally present here. I am not seeing any WhatsApp activity so far. So this way, the, this is a con con concrete where you have the maximum deaths are taking place. And with the insurance policies, now the death certificate is mandatory to submit for all legal purpose. So hospital certification of death has improved and almost 70% uh, of the cornea, we do get it from the hospital cornea retrieval program. Voluntary donations, yes, it has its shortcomings and uh, with the environment and with the mindset. Mindset is very, very important. And uh, in uh, Indian mythology, I won't call it the Hindu mythology, all is the Indian mythology, where it says that if you are going with the one organ missing, probably you will get the next generation, you will come with that organ without that organ. And that is why if you find that the Indian Armed Forces has a only 1200 million, uh, 12 lakhs people there, because only then this many number of people have gone earlier without having brain there. So they have come here back without brain. I am one of them. <laughs> when you have, a, there was a one auction for the brain. One of the Nobel Prize winner, second was the Armed Forces Personal and third one was the XYZ. So the highest prize bid was given for the Armed Forces Brain was because it was never used. <laughs> we always believe in saying yes, madam, and yes, sir. Yes, madam. <laughs> so advantages I have already mentioned about the hospital uh, retrieval program. Now, um, Nitin Gadkari has done a good job in the infrared uh, surface uh, road infrastructure development, same way in the uh, Transport Motor Vehicle Act. And now it is uh, mandatory that you have to use uh, the blood group has to be mentioned and about, uh, there is an optional to mention about the eye donation. So that is a, the gradually changes are taking place. How many minutes are left? I don't have watch. Five minutes? Huh. For me and five minutes for them. Or only five minutes. So what the uh, road have, road map we are having now the eye banking has to be upgraded by uh, and to be accredited by the NABH. Probably part next time when uh, your next generation when they'll go for marriage, they will also require a certification from the NABH on the different parameters. <laughs> so you must know about the NABH also. It is very very important for your practice everywhere where you are going on. So quality is a paramount, training is the key. You need to train the people, you need to train the technicians, you need to train the surgeons, you need to train the uh, uh, counselors and generate the awareness. So as a ophthalmologist, you are the team leader for the eye banking and corneal transplant team. And you have to improve your performance first and then disseminate your knowledge to the other and uh, as independent working is becoming difficult for practitioners also they are having the corporate group for the parties also they have the alliances so same way the independent and standalone eye bank cannot sustain in this uh, voluntary this process so you have to club resources in the uh, city and uh, around so what to conclude is the mandatory notification to eye banks for all hospital deaths from short term media to intermediate or long term media. Focus on financial sustainability of eye bank. It's very, very important. This corporate support is essential for it. Building network for wider distribution of corneas, usage of technology for better data tracking, patient discovery program, surgeon's training program. And uh, finally, uh, for me, uh, it may not be that important, but for you, it's too very important to note down my email IDs and mobile number. For any queries, you can always uh, contact me. And I assure you that I am not going to give you any email or this thing asking for any vote, because I am not contesting any election. The last uh, one minute I will take, no religious on this earth 
says that eye donation or any organ donation is not correct. May some uh, may say that Islam has a restriction. Islam doesn't have the restriction. I have gone through it. And uh, in the Sark meeting, we had a uh, from uh, Bangladesh. They have uh, same uh, legislations and they conduct in their all masjid mosque meetings. They promote uh, this uh, about the organ donations. Christians, they allow and maximum eye donations are from the Buddhist. So all uh, this thing they have. Even the Shani doesn't say, Shani can give prakop to anyone, but not for the eye donations. Thank you very much. <laughs> I told you I'll give you nano input. So I've given you nano input only. Thank you, sir. I hope uh, things, sir has made things clear in 15 minutes, eye banking. Right? <laughs> okay, uh, just one question I want to ask. Anybody who wants to volunteer can stand. It's, it's, it's okay. Anybody. I'm, I'm going to ask the question only when somebody stands over here. Anybody, it's okay. We are all the same. No? What is an absolute contraindication for eye donation? Ab to koi khade ho jau. I thought sir was teaching eye banking and uh, corneal preservation techniques. So anybody could just volunteer, stand up, introduce yourself, and let me know what is the contraindication for cornea donation or say eye donation. Think of a communicable disease which is deadly. Come on, come on. See, otherwise we are wasting yeah. time. Let's, a, let's try and understand an, uh, there's that. There's a hand raised. Yeah, go ahead. What is seropositive? One is HIV. Great. Good. What okay. else? Okay, great. Okay, what else? Okay. A viral disease that has almost 100% mortality. Sorry, what did you say? Rabies. What else? Come on. Come on, come on, come go on. Ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry? Crucible Jacob disease, yes. Okay, very good. What else? Sorry? Yes, unknown death, yes. Uh, no. How do you know what is ocular surface disorder? How do you know? Sorry? Oh, okay, I mean, that anyway we know. We, we are taking a normal cornea. We are presuming when you are taking it for transplant, it has to be a normal cornea. See, what's happening, what's happening here is, and you must differentiate, is that the cornea can now be split. So someone with a bad uh, ocular surface, <laughs> the endothelium may still be healthy. So one can use the endothelium in that patient. So it's not an absolute contraindication. What Dr. Ritu is asking is absolute, which means you cannot transfer this into the donor, into the recipient. So uh, That's why sir said saying. that we will always get the blood, okay? And from where do you draw the blood of the donor? Sorry? Kya bola? Bolo, bolo, jaldi bolo na. Kal ko tum jaoge. Konya lene ke liye. So there are mics in between. So you guys can... Take it on heart. <laughs> bolo, 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 bache. See, we are here to learn. Let's not go from here without. Jaise aay the, vaisi gaye. Huh? Heart, okay. So first you will try from a peripheral way. If you can't get it, then you put in the heart using a 21 gauge needle, okay, which is a must. And what are the four tests? Sir said we draw blood. Four tests which you will do in the eye bank before you release this cornea for use. Something what she said, absolute contraindication. HIV? So HIV you will do for HIV. HIV, you will do for hepatitis B, you will do for hep C, you will do for syphilis, okay? So at some point of time, we were even taking the donor cornea, uh, COVID. Now, of course, it's not uh, there. And then another contraindication, you should have relative contraindications are poisonings. Because sometimes it happens. You're confronted with case, they say the donor has died due to organophorous phosphorus poisoning, rat poison, you know. So, I lena hai ya nahi lena hai? 
And another thing which you will be confronted is death due to septicemia, which is very, very common. Okay, so death due to septicemia till now is a contraindication. And uh, um, intraocular malignancies and orbital malignancies, yes. that also been... This is also an in. absolute... So we have got calls when they said that, oh, a patient had a maxillary carcinoma and we are doing radical maxillectomy and we are taking out the eye. Aap aake cornea le jaiye. So you have to refuse. We got calls at times when we are doing enucleation for retinoblastoma and they said cornea theek hai, aap use kar lijiye. So you're, you should have that much of knowledge. An absolute contraindication which you all forgot was blood dyscrasias. You know, all your leukemias, lymphomas is absolute contraindication. Then it's also added any malignancy in the eye, in the area which is close to the eye, head and neck. I mean, that's also some people consider. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. I thought when they go... They yeah, yeah, because I was given topic where this uh, was to for the eye banking and preservatives. I have reduced this. I yeah, knew I know. It's very difficult to talk, but uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now I invite Dr. Rishi, who is consultant, who is the director of MMI Tech and is also consultant for CFS Delhi. And he's a dear friend, we'll be a batchmate, so we've grown up together, did our PG together, everything together, and now working in Konya. So he will be walking you through his uh, different techniques of penetrating keratoplasty. And beta, please, if you're here, be absolutely free to stop the person and ask the question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. agree with Dr. Ritu, if there's any, see, this is a, this is supposed to be a more informal kind of a yeah. uh, interaction, okay? Anything that you don't understand, that you think this is going on now, so stop, because otherwise, what is the Otherwise, that means you're not really getting the benefit of the, of the talk. So, um, can I have my slides? Great, can you see them all? Yeah? Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about penetrating keratoplasty. Now, we all know that uh, um, keratoplasty is now uh, uh, been split. We are now doing lamellar keratoplasty, in fact, more often than we are doing uh, full thickness grafts. But full thickness grafts still remain the very basis, uh, and it will always be a part of our training because uh, the basic handling, the basic understanding, the aftercare, is uh, almost entirely uh, full thickness related. And uh, one must have uh, expertise in full thickness keratoplasty even if one is doing lamellas because you may at any point need to convert from uh, doing uh, say an anterior lamellar and you have a large puff, you may have to go for a full thickness graft. And then if you're not fully conversant with the system, then you might find yourself in a little bit of trouble. So um, we'll, we'll talk about this, and uh, I think the first thing we'll go through is very carefully or very briefly the history, because uh, Dr. Parya has beautifully covered this, and I'm not going to spend much time on it. The indications, the anesthesia and the preparation, the technique itself, which involves broadly two aspects, the trephination and the suturing, then a few uh, aspects about the post-operative care, and uh, as uh, Santosh had written to me to cover complications, I've thrown in a few slides. This is a full, these are full talks in itself, impossible to cover in the time given. And then just a few lines about astigmatism control, okay? So the history, as we all know, was uh, it was first done in 1905 by Edward Zerm in, in Czechoslovakia, but it was Filatov, really, who uh, built keratoplasty, uh, the, the, the basic building blocks of keratoplasty were really laid down by him. Uh, where in 1912 to 1936 he was working on this subject and he was the f one who successfully grafted the corneal tissue from a deceased person and in 1936 widely published the details. And then Castro Viejo did the first transplantation in advanced keratoconus and achieved a significant improvement in vision. So historically these advances in operating microscopes, we've got better and finer surgical instruments, there have been advances in material science, enabling high quality uh, steel for production of needles and sutures. The establishment and the quality that has improved in uh, eye banking, 
We've got better quality tissues with excellent storage media now. This has all helped to bring uh, keratoplasty to be the most widely performed uh, transplant surgery. You know which is the most widely performed transplant surgery on the planet? It's the cornea. So, uh, so there are more corneal transplants done than all other transplants combined. So that's how uh, common and successful it is. So um, just from any standard text, you can get this brief history wherein right from the 1813, where the suggestion was made to replace corneal tissue, uh, all the way to uh, the mid-70s when McCary and Kaufman uh, came up with the MK medium, and that really actually helped uh, keratoplasty grow big time. Let's talk about the indications. Now, broadly, there are four categories. Uh, we have optical indications. Optical means where you're actually doing a replacement of the cornea with a better vision in mind. Uh, there are tectonic uh, or preparatory grafts, as they are also called by some, wherein we are putting in or doing grafts as a preparation to another procedure later on. Therapeutic grafts, where we are trying to save the globe. And these are essentially uh, indications where uh, in trauma or in... Uh, in an infective keratitis where the globe is likely to be lost, and then cosmetic, wherein there is a large scar and there's somebody who wants to um, get this cornea replaced to hide the scar. So the commonest indication used to be bullous keratopathy um, for full thickness grafts. It's changed, and I'll show you some statistics showing this change over the years. Dystrophies, degenerations, uh, ectasias, keratoconus used to be a very, very important um, indication for full thickness graft and corneal scarring following infections, traumas, and malnutrition, which are really the most common indications still in many developing countries. Therapeutic keratoplasty, as I mentioned already, largely due to, uh, for a replacement of a badly infected cornea, and tectonic keratoplasty, which are reconstructive in nature, where we are trying to restore the corneal or the anterior segment anatomy, and the physiology, and uh, where the better visual acuity is actually secondary, but we are trying to do something to retain the globe and maintain the architecture to an extent. And co cosmetic keratoplasties, as I said earlier, wherein we are looking at it only from a cosmetic point of view, these are really not uh, eyes which have very good vision potential. So the indications, again, you can uh, pick them up from any standard textbook, uh, and uh, they're all can be listed from anywhere. So just briefly, if one goes through these indications and sees the trend with time, uh, going from 1993 and then going into the early 2000s and then into the last decade, um, one will notice that what used to be keratoconus as the commonest in the developing world or the developed world, uh, now the commonest reason for doing a full thickness keratoplasty is actually a regraft because they were all patients who were done 15 or 20 years ago. So almost 40% of corneas undergoing full thickness keratoplasty are actually retransplants because these corneas were done a decade or two earlier, and now they're coming in for a second graft. Um, and uh, in the uh, developing world, uh, it's still therapeutic. So the full thickness grafts, still therapeutic grafts, tend to be almost half the full thickness grafts that are being done uh, will be for therapeutic purposes. When we talk about the preoperative evaluation, it's like evaluating anybody coming in for any anterior segment surgery, and it's fairly common with, uh, say, a cataract evaluation. So one will look at the ocular history, the general history, one will do an ocular examination, look at the visual acuity, a gross exam, a slit lamp biomicroscopy. One must check the intraocular pressure. Not always easy to do, given the fact that there is corneal pathology, and uh, in a corneal pathology, it's very, very tough to get a good quality IOP. But that's where your fingers also come in and out there practically. Sometimes that's just about the only way to do something transpalpably and try and figure out what the uh, pressure is like. So make it a habit to uh, pretty much do IOP in every single patient that you see because you have to do hundreds of thousands of these for your fingers to get the sensitivity where you can actually tell the difference between two and four millimeters. Okay, so uh, just make it a habit. It's a good thing. And then, of course, investigations, again, you'll do a refraction, you'll do the ocular surface evaluation, a keratometry if possible, a gonioscopy if possible, again. Uh, a pachymetry helps because you know how thick or thin that cornea is. Uh, if you are able to get hold of a specular microscopy and so on, that's useful. Interferometry as a prognosticator, 
and then tomographies and uh, a UBM to see what the periphery and the chamber is like, ultrasonography, both A and B scans, especially many of these graphs are combined with other procedures like cataracts, so there it's even more important to have the posterior segment evaluation. And of course your electrophysiological tests to ensure that you're not dealing with someone who will not going to benefit from this graft. So in the ocular and general history, one must look at uh, the possibility of amblyopia, go back into the history big time, the use of anti-glaucoma medications sometimes, uh, and I think we've all who've done keratoplasties in large numbers have come across people where we've done a graft only to find a 0.95 cup uh, at the back, uh, and these are burnt out glaucomas. Uh, so uh, it's important to have done that because it's a lot of effort wasted uh, for a precious cornea. Um, the ocular exam, of course, visual acuity, the gross ocular examination, again, look at the lids and the ocular surface. The ocular surface is extremely critical, even more critical than it is in any other ocular surgery because the ocular surface health is critical to the graft health in the long term and uh, a bad ocular surface will lead to uh, a very high degree of failure. And uh, so dry eye, and as well as other anomalies of the lids and the ocular surface, stem cell deficiency especially, is extremely important to be assessed. So the outcomes themselves and the prognosis are again classified into four major categories. One is what we call excellent prognosis or category one. These are the patients who have an excellent cornea otherwise with central corneal disease, maybe a small scar or keratoconus is part of this or a central, uh, central corneal dystrophy uh, with an otherwise healthy eye. So these are those with excellent over 90% success. And category two is those with good prognosis, but the opacity involves uh, part of the periphery as well. There's some vascularization also now in it, which is not more than a couple of quadrants. Uh, many of the bullous keratopathies and all come into this, into this category uh, and the prognosis in these patients is around 80% success. Category 3 is those which have fair prognosis and these are where the, there's a lot of variation in the thickness, there is a, a larger amount of vascularization that is there, uh, the pathology goes all the way out to the periphery of the cornea like in keratoglobus and so on and here the prognosis is fair with between a 50 to 80% chance. And category 4 uh, what we used to call PKD uh, is those with the poor prognosis where there is, uh, uh, you know, all of those things that I've mentioned here, including a very bad surface, extensive vascularization, or multiple graft failures. Multiple graft failures uh, have a very, very high risk of failure. Uh, here, the prognosis is definitely less than 50%. And if uh, one looks at the various factors that influence the survival of the graft, there was a collaborative corneal transplant study uh, which... Uh, actually listed all these uh, factors that are there, uh, which uh, lead to graft failure and reduce the prognosis quite substantially. The preparation and the anesthesia are uh, very important because uh, as uh, residents, uh, when you are working with the consultant, this is the area that you will actually have to be doing initially uh, before you actually become a consultant yourself. So the pre-op preparation is just like, pretty much like a cataract. The peri and interop preparation is again like any anterior segment surgery. Here one must look at the, especially see, remember our full thickness keratoplasty is open sky surgery. You're going to take out the cornea and the cornea and the eye is going to remain open for a certain length of time before you can secure things down. You cannot have too much of upheaval, otherwise you'll have things coming out. You'll have the lens coming out, you'll have the vitreous coming out and of course the iris coming out. And so <coughs> keeping the intraocular pressure down and ensuring that there is uh, the the speculums and all that are nicely applied is very important. So an IV mannitol and the kind of anesthesia you give, uh, anesthesia general is always preferred, essentially because A, these are longish surgeries, they can take an hour or longer. Um, you have much better IOP control, the patient is far more stable and uh, one can adjust the angle and everything else on table if the patient is under GA, which is more difficult, but there will be situations where GA is not possible and there the local anesthetic has to be given and good akinesia is extremely important because you can't operate a keratoplasty on a moving eye. Uh, so we talk about the technique and we talk about trefines. Uh, trefine is a circular blade and uh, there are host or recipient trefines and donor trefines. The donor trefines can be from the epithelial side or they can be from the endothelial side which are called punches. And this is just a, a, a scattering of the various kind of trefines that we see. Uh, there are various names to these. There's a Castro Viejo on the 
upper left, there's the, uh, this is the Cottingham punch. Those are three finds, which again are freehand. And uh, this is the Baron punch at the bottom left. And then there are the circular handheld tree finds or the motorized tree finds. The one that you see on the left corner is the Hannah's, which is a motorized tree find with a single blade that rotates and uh, covers the Castroviejo tree find with the obturator and the uh, uh, biopsy punches. And then, of course, now the vacuum tree finds, which are the Hesburgh Baron tree finds, <coughs> which are on the upper right. <coughs> so almost invariably, we would prefer to prepare the donor first. Any reason why we prepared, uh, prepare the donor first? If the donor tissue is not adequate, good. Any other reason? You may damage it, okay? It may fall. Um, you are trying to refine it, the tree fine slips. Anything can happen. So always have your donor, otherwise once you've cut the recipient, there's no going back you'll have to put the recipient cornea back into place and stitch it back if you've done that first and you can have a mismatch and so on. So preparing the donor first is generally a good idea, but there are some exceptions to this. Where would you not cut the donor first? Therapeutic, Therapeutic. excellent, good answer. Any other, anything else? So post-trauma, okay, because there may be some freehand work that you may have to do. You may decide, I want to do an 8mm graft, you may land up with a 9, but if you've already prepared an 8mm donor, then you're in trouble, right? So there are certain areas where one would uh, like to do the uh, recipient first. So this is the vacuum tree find. I'm not sure if all of you have seen these. Have all of you seen tree finds? Yes? Yeah, excellent. So you mark the cornea, you... Uh, you place the tree fine, apply the vacuum sunk, uh, the vacuum, and then you go through, and there is a rotation that happens. Does anyone know how much depth you cover in the rotation? It's all there. It's all very fixed. One complete rotation gives you how much of depth, because there is a there is a pitch. Uh, every full 360 degree rotation of this will give you a certain amount of depth in your cornea. One full rotation. 25? 25% Tw of what? No, no, this is an absolute term, it's in microns. So every full rotation that you will go with the tree fine will give you a depth of X microns. I want the answer to that. Sorry, I missed out then. Yeah, so it's 250 microns uh, per full rotation. So every quarter rotation gives you 62 and a half. So uh, one can almost comfortably make two full rotations because you'll go 500 microns and there's hardly any uh, cornea that is less than 500 when you're actually transplanting. And uh, then uh, one can do, and I, as you could see here, one can take the vacuum tree fine off and complete the rest with either a blade or you can allow a little bit of aqueous to come through the moment the aqueous comes through and you can actually see it, you have to stop because it means you're already penetrated. If you go in further, you'll cut up the iris or if the chamber has flattened, you can even do a full capsular excessor. So you have to be very careful if you don't want to uh, go into that area. Okay. Uh, and then there's freehand trephination. And here you can see a bad cornea with a very large uh, opacity. Uh, and uh, you had to actually do a full peritomy because you might need a 10 or 11 millimeter graft. And these punches and vacuum tree finds only come up to size nine. Beyond that, they are not available. So anything beyond that, you have to do freehand. So like we are doing here, one does freehand work. That's gone. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can do uh, scleral trephination. I mean, all the way up to you can get tree finds. They are available, but they are freehand. They are not. Uh, they are not mechanized. And then, of course, the latest technique on the block is uh, if someone is uh, uber rich, one can use this. Uh, it's the femto laser, uh, where uh, one can uh, uh, cut both the donor uh, on the chamber, on the artificial chamber, and one can use it for the eye as well. And here we just adjust the depth, and we go ahead and start the resection. It just takes a few seconds. It gives a beautiful cut, no doubt. Uh, it's probably. Uh, the way to go, it does help to uh, improve the apposition, cut down the total number of uh, stitches that one would apply. And uh, I'll show you a small clip of actually a suture-less uh, keratoplasty as well. 
So uh, we talk next about uh, suturing and uh, by far the single most important aspect of doing a good transplant is to be able to suture it well. So the objectives here are to obtain a perfectly aligned uh, watertight closure uh, quickly and to minimize the tissue compression with unequal tension and uh, maintain as large an optical zone as possible. So, so for imagine you're doing a seven millimeter graft and in the seven millimeter graft you're taking one millimeter bites on each side. So you've only got like five millimeters left and then the stretch doesn't give you much. So that will give you a very poorly distorted uh, central uh, aspect if you're going in too close. So very small grafts, especially one has to be very careful with this optical zone business. So minimize the tissue distortion and astigmatism. Always think about the possibilities of suture adjustment. It's very easy to do, uh, but without, if you're not thinking what's going to be the next step, Sometimes you may find it very difficult to remove. Lagana bada asaan hai, and then when you have to take them out, it's a nightmare. Ease of handling of suture-related complications. And believe me, there are complications related to sutures. And you may have to remove these sutures or adjust them, and that's where this bit comes in. And then, of course, there's a surgeon preference and the indications um, which initiated why we are doing a certain form or a format of suturing. The needles and the, and the filament thread is very important again. Uh, remember, shorter cord lengths and steeper curvatures will give you shorter bites and deeper bites, which is what we want, which is very unlike most other surgeries where we want to incorporate a large amount of tissue. So you want to have a shallow bite. So those are large uh, quarter circle or three-eighth circle needles. What do we need? Half circles. And they have to be mini curves, and I'll show you that. So long cord lengths, large curvatures will give you shallower and wider bites. We want smaller bites, but going almost full thickness, 90%. So uh, there are these needles, the full curve needle, the mini curve needle. These are all half uh, circle needles. The mini curve has a smaller cord length. The full curve has a larger cord length. The bi-curve needle, which has more than one uh, radii of curvature. And then there's the compound curve, which has more than two radii of curvature. They get more and more difficult to handle, uh, and they become more and more expensive as well. Really, in my own hands, uh, they don't really give that much advantage and they're not easily available. As far as the, the suture material itself is concerned, there's monofilament nylon. By far, 10 nylon is the uh, standard of care uh, for almost all keratoplasties. There's proline as well, there's polyester, not easy again to find, and one can use combinations of these uh, materials. And there's braided silk, especially in therapeutic grafts, sometimes in pediatrics in uh, where you are, where your time is of the essence. You very quickly want to just close this wound, then using a 8O silk uh, sometimes does the job. Therapeutic grafts where the tissue cheese wires, then you need a thicker, uh, a thicker suture material as well. When we actually talk of transferring the graft, we have to see the fit, and you have to see the sphericity to try and minimize the astigmatism. One of your long-term aims is to create the minimum amount of malapposition as possible. One millimeter of malapposition uh, will generate about four diopters of astigmatism. So uh, uh, it's important that uh, you do appose it uh, uh, when you are placing it in the recipient bed, and I'll show you, I think there is a video on this. And the sutures must pass directly beneath the grass point. So when you hold the cornea, try and exit the suture underneath it so you can actually see. If you are on either side, you're going to create torque. And when you create torque and you release it, you'll find the needle will move because you're not radial. So if you, are, if you grasp the anterior cornea and you exit with the suture right underneath the grasp point, you will have no torque. Two parts to the suturing, primary and secondary or definitive. Primary is also called the cardinal suture. So the cardinal sutures may be typically four, or if it's a larger graft, you may be more comfortable with eight. And they're again given at the 12, 6, 3, 9, or a little bit of a, a variation on that. Uh, initially, the first suture or the next suture you may apply with a dual pronged forceps because that doesn't give you torque. A single forceps will give you torque. And uh, this cornea is not really adhered to anything. It's not stitches. The first stitch you are passing. So the cornea is going to come with you. So you must hold it with a dual prong. That way you can go between the prongs and come out. And in the end, is to idea is to get this diamond-shaped uh, um, pattern on the cornea. 
use slip knots. I'm not sure if we are all trained how to do slip knots, but I'll show you one, and that's the one that I ordinarily use. We use uh, four quadrants and then more cardinal sutures as necessary. And one must uh, keep the AC as well formed as possible throughout. It will collapse. Keep reforming it because it gives you uh, a better closure. Condyl transplant surgery is all about aesthetics. So if it's looking pretty, it's probably doing well, okay? So, so here we are. So you can see that we have, uh, we have uh, done this and uh, we've got this uh, Flyringa ring in place in patients who have been vitrectomized or have had uh, multiple procedures, it's a great thing. And you can see how well uh, the cornea is actually sitting inside its bed uh, without there being any overlap or anything. And uh, here I'll just show you, uh, I think there is, yeah. So it's a, it's a single throw and you pick up the leading, uh, you pick up the, the trailing uh, suture length and you bring it to the side and then you go and you go like a V pattern and you pull it across. And uh, notice uh, that as I tighten this suture, and I'll just zoom up there, you'll see the knot actually slips down onto the tissue. And as it slips down onto the tissue, you'll see a whitening appear. This whitening tells you there's corneal compression. The tissue is being compressed as the knot tightens, and one can get a very good idea of uh, how, much, uh, how much of the tightening you've actually produced. And then you can go, uh, you know, 3-9 on the pull and 9-3 on the pull and you'll get your two knots on top of that which locks your knot. So that's very important and you can then use the same thing. This is the same thing in slow motion wherein we are showing you how to do with a single, many people will use two or three throws that will lock the, uh, the teno nylon from slipping but it's impossible to adjust. So if you over tighten it or you keep it loose, you can't fix it. With the slip knot, you can actually pull it up or push it back based on, um, uh, because it's a single throw, so it will slip till you lock it into place. So here again, just to show you how the slip knot works, you can actually bring it down onto the corneal surface and do that and you can actually see that whitening. And then one can use the, uh, the you can use the thread to find the position across so that you have to bisect the cornea so if you, if you try and pick up the, so what people will do, will they will hold the uh, cornea and pull it to get that groove, but you're damaging the cornea every time you do it. So one can do the same thing with just the thread. Just go across to six o'clock and you can define your point where uh, you would like to place the next suture. So once this is done, one can uh, move a little forward. So you've done the same thing at the six o'clock position, applied your slip knot, and one can then place the other two cardinal sutures and uh, let me see, one can see how the, the diamond will appear and then, whoops, the diamond's disappeared. Okay, so I've already gone into the, uh, into the secondary cardinals. It's a fairly large graph, so it, you'll create an octagon then, right? So this is the, so here you can see how an octagon gets produced with each of the cardinals uh, doing their job. Let's move on. Let's talk about the final closure patterns. And here again, we are all familiar with the single continuous, the single continuous no torque, the double continuous, where there is one torque and one anti-torque, the double continuous, which is unidirectional, the interrupteds, and then the combinations of interrupteds and continuous. So these are all the uh, suturing patterns that are possible. And uh, one will, uh, I think, uh, if you go into coronal surgeries, you will start to use them more and more often. The single continuous is by far the quickest. It's easy to adjust and to remove. The only problem is you have to be very careful that you don't touch the tip of the, the needle because if you do, you'll have blunting. And then remember, it's the same needle that you have to go through 20 times. And if you blunted it, then you might have to, or if it breaks, then you have to splice it with another one because you can't be taking out the, you know, the six, eight loops that you already applied to restart from scratch. Then there's the continuous no torque. Far more difficult to do because the bite is not radial. The bite is oblique. So what it creates is isosceles triangles, but it doesn't create torque. When you put a radial stitch, it's the diagonal stitch across. When you tighten it, it pulls the cornea in that clockwise or anti-clockwise fashion, creating torque. So to avoid torque, one can use a, a, a no torque technique, but again, it's far more difficult to do, needs far more practice, and remember, you need a much larger needle because you're going obliquely through tissues, 
So you'll need more tissue length, you'll need more needle length on either side. The double continuous here is the torque and anti-torque, where one can put one clockwise stitch and then put one anti-clockwise stitch. So you assume that the two torques will neutralize each other because one is pushing it this way, the other is pushing it the other way. But they're very difficult to do and they're very difficult to adjust. And the worst is that their long-term benefit is unproven. So uh, then really the whole purpose of uh, spending so much time and energy to do a uh, suturing doesn't make sense. Then the double continuous unidirectional has advantages because you can use two materials. So you use a 10 nylon and you use an 11 polyester. The 11 polyester is, desi is designed to stay there for years and years, whereas the 10 nylon can come off uh, at a much earlier time. So, and then the interrupted suture is something that we'll all learn. There used to be a thumb rule uh, called pi D, which is to decide the number of sutures. The number of sutures used to be three times the diameter. So the diameter is seven, you'd use 21 because that would be the diameter of the, uh, of the graft. Uh, it is three times the diameter, so you get a suture every one millimeter. Uh, and, but now, of course, with the way the trephination is, uh, we don't use that many sutures. The number of sutures have reduced a lot. So the difficulties with interrupted is one, that there are multiple knots and each knot adds to vascularization to an extent and they're difficult to remove. The other problem is you can't adjust an interrupted suture. You can either take it out or leave it. So if you take it out, if things are loose, you may have to reapply it. So that is the, the difficulty with, uh, with this thing. But there's easier post-op control of astigmatism and it's great for pediatric corneas and for vascularized corneas and naturally for therapeutic grafts where you may have to repeat the suturing multiple number of times on table. The combined interrupted and continuous pretty much mixes and matches the best of both these worlds, uh, but it does take a uh, little longer in terms of time. And again, the long-term benefit in sutures out astigmatism has not yet been proven. So here is uh, 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 the final suturing, uh, just a small video to show. You remember the patient where we had done those eight bites and now we will just go in and put uh, this uh, suture. So we'll put two bites in between each of these quadrants and that will give you uh, 8 plus 16 byte continuous. The 8 bytes of interrupted can be removed at various times uh, for astigmatism control, and the, the uh, 16 byte can be left for much longer uh, for securing this cornea. Uh, let me fast forward this. Okay. So no technique of definitive suturing has been conclusively found to be more superior. So that is one take home you should have. And every surgeon must find his or her comfort zone simply because uh, for different patients, for different indications, you may find one technique to be superior to the others, which basically means you need to know all of them. Okay. So try different closure techniques and with experience, you will identify what works best in your hands. Um, of course, a brief here about the future, which is that uh, superior refining techniques have come. I already showed you the, uh, the, the uh, femtolaser, and you can minimize the suturing by improving the cut profile and the flange. The femtolasers have improved the precision of apposition, and we have sutureless keratoplasties and the use of tissue glues now, where there will really be uh, no suturing. So here's just uh, uh, a small video clip of a, of a a, a su uh, of a lamellar keratoplasty being done by uh, the microkeratome, where one just uh, does the same thickness for both and just lays the clear cornea on top of the other and just sticks it with glue. So uh, uh, very, very effective um, and very quick, very less likelihood of uh, complications, but as you can see, very limited indications and very, very expensive. So here the glue is applied and uh, after the glue is applied, just a wash is given and then after that a contact lens is placed and pretty much that's the end of the surgery. There we are. So a couple of slides about the post-operative care, very important, standard post-operative treatments, 
early post-op management is on visual acuity, degree of pain, and slit lamp exams. The slit lamp examination must look at the corneal epithelium, the graft clarity, check the anterior chamber depth, look for a wound leak and hypotony, and do a sedals if necessary. Uh, look for uh, the apposition, the tight or loose suture, the pupil shape, whether there is any iris touch or incarceration, any AC reaction or signs of infection, and of course, medically manage the elevated IOP. The standard post-operative schedule, again, it's variable, but uh, it has to be more frequent, and then the frequency goes down. The most critical period in a full thickness transplant is typically about 100 days. So much of the, reje the rejections and immune reactions that you will have will happen in that period, and uh, whatever will happen, almost 90% of them will happen in the first year. So the first year following a transplant is the critical year, and that's the area that one must always look out for. Post-operative complications, uh, again, something that one must know. There may be ocular surface related, there may be wound related, uh, there may be suture related, pressure related, there may be donor related, and there are miscellaneous, like infections, like endophthalmitis, or a bleed inside the chamber. Late complications, again, surface related. It may be drug induced, so medicamentosa is a very important aspect in this. Again, wound related, suture related, pressure related, again, donor related and uh, miscellaneous like posterior segment concerns, astigmatism, which is something that I'll very briefly speak of, and that because the astigmatism control really starts while you're operating. And uh, how much time is left? Finished? Yeah. So I will just briefly tell you about the intraoperative adjustment, uh, which can be qualitative, and the post-operative intervention, which is done using corneal topography, which usually starts after a few weeks. So after the surgery is over, um, one must look at the, uh, the kind of uh, astigmatism that one is likely to create. So one deepens the chamber, releases the speculum, checks whether the IOP is okay, releases any bridal or any sutures that has, one has in the recti, and then uses a device to try and see the circularity of the Myers, uh, to try and see if one can give you as, as circular a Meyer as possible, make the adjustments of the slack, pick it up from where the, the wire, uh, the Myers are uh, flat and spread them to where the Myers are steep. So this is uh, everything that is online uh, happening on table and do a topography later to identify the tight sutures and the suture adjustment of the running sutures. And you all know about topography, there are hot areas and cold areas, hot areas are steep zones and cold areas are generally zones which are flatter and one needs to take the tension from the uh, cold areas and put them into the hot areas. So the hot areas become laxer and, this, and the flat areas become steeper. So adjust the loop tension and for interrupted sutures, just do a selective sequential removal with or without a resuturing. And here one can see how one suture removal can make a huge difference to uh, the topography. Uh, clinically, of course, one should look at this when the graft is stable, but before there is substantial amount of uh, wound healing. If the wound has completely healed, adjusting these sutures is going to make no difference So because it's already jammed. So this is how the suture can be adjusted on the slit lamp. Uh, so you just have to freshen the epithelium a little bit and pick up that 10 nylon and pull it based on, the, on the, what the topography had suggested. Management of sutures out astigmatism is a full lecture in itself, but this is just the list of all the possibilities that are there to uh, take care of post-suture or suture out astigmatism. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions before I move on to the next uh, talk. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Namrita Sharma will be taking her talk on one of the other days. Uh, there is a meeting going on, so it, is, it has been adjusted in a way that you all will be uh, able to uh, take the lecture from her. Don't worry about it. And we have Sir's lecture, uh, which is by Alcon. And it is uh, ocular surface and dry eyes after cataract surgery. Am I right, sir? That's correct. Okay. So, uh, sir, we'll proceed with this topic for that. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, um, so what happened was uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I am, oh, but there's still, uh, you can still ask me questions on the previous thing. Anything that you would like me to clarify or to substantiate or to elaborate, let me know. In the meanwhile, I request uh, uh, Dr. Rakshit, Dr. Rukaya, and Dr. Priyanka to please submit your presentation. 
Uh, this is the last call for the same. So I'm going to give a talk um, which actually has come to us from Alcon. Now Alcon is a company, as you all know, that uh, does pretty much everything, but uh, uh, it's, it's on dry eye and the focus is going to be post cataract surgery. Now the commonest surgery that you're likely to be doing for the rest of your lives is cataract surgery. And uh, uh, this is not a commercial talk, um, but it's, it's very nicely constructed because it highlights the importance of the ocular surface, something that we don't uh, very often look at when we are examining our cataract patients. We just go, we bypass the ocular surface completely and go straight into the anterior chamber. We are a little concerned about the retina because we are looking at outcomes, but we forget that there is an ocular surface also and there is a cornea through which the rays of light have to pass first before it even reaches the lens. So uh, it's important, it's an important talk in that sense. And so I'll just be uh, giving you uh, a brief introduction on the ocular surface post cataract surgery, a preoperative dry eye and its impact on your outcomes. What steps can we take to reduce the post operative dry eye? What ocular surface management should we do post cataract surgery? And what is the place of the higher end uh, uh, lubricants such as hyaluronic acid with uh, technical data to support that? So, um, just a brief idea. You know how many cataract surgeries are done in India? Ballpark figure in a year. Any idea? So in 2020, we did about six and a half million. All right. And uh, I don't think we have the latest data, but it's projected to be seven and a half million this year. And we'll probably go up to nine million in the next couple of years. And we'll probably touch ten and a half million every year by the time we reach 2025. 10 and a half million cataract surgeries, okay? And half of them have a dry eye. So it's a, this is a very important talk. Huh? So that's 27 million surgeries in three years. So um, what is the dry eye prevalence post cataract surgery? Any wild guesses? Dry eye prevalence post cataract surgery. Huh? 24%? 25%? Okay. We can start with that at the lowest end. Anyone going higher? 40%. Okay, now we are talking. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, check this out. So it's age-wise, huh? So they are young cataract patients and they are old cataract patients. Mostly we deal with old cataract patients. So look at the column on the extreme right. That is the age group 66 to 75. So we are actually nowhere near, huh? 100%. So every patient post cataract surgery that you'll evaluate for dry eye who is in that age group will show some signs of dry eye. Now I'll justify that. So it's not coming out of the top of my head. And there are studies at the bottom here. One is in 2022 in Journal of Clinical Medicine and the other is in the, interna interna uh, the International Journal of uh, Medical Sciences in 2015. So this is data coming from there. So dry eye is amongst the most common complications of cataract surgery. Okay, and up to 100% of patients may experience dry eye following cataract surgery. How long does this dryness last? Any wild guesses again? So if there's a patient with no dry eye and you do a cataract surgery and he has a dry eye, wo ek hafta mein theek ho jata? Nahi? Do hafta mein? Do mein? Three months? Who said three months? Chocolate hai? Nahi? Achha. Anyway. Um, that's very good. It may take up to three months for the stabilization of the breakup time and the Shermer's test following FACO. Okay. And you can see here how the TBOT and the Shermer's dips and how it gradually recovers. And after three months, it pretty much starts to uh, come back to baseline level. But three months is a long time. And uh, patients by that time have already made up their opinion about how bad a surgeon you are. So uh, one must know that this is the time to uh, act on these patients. So ocular surface post cataract surgery and dry eye, this is the pathophysiology, okay? So there is nerve transection. We are typically doing temporal surgeries. What is there in the temporal cornea? Yeah, so all your long ciliaries come from the temporal and the nasal side. So that's the area which you're going to cut and you're going to be transecting quite a few nerves. Then there's definite inflammation or is there any doubt about that? So there's an elevation of inflammation as well. And then there's goblet cell loss 
and there is a meibomian gland dysfunction. So this is all happening post any ocular surgery and cataract surgery is no exception. This is what happens when you do a corneal nerve transgression. The, there are structural changes, there's epithelial wound healing delay, there's increased epithelial permeability, there's uh, metabolic activity which gets decreased, there's loss of cytoskeletal structures, there's a decrease in sensitivity and a subsequent reduction in tear production. And so the diminished sensation is noted along the entire width and the length of the tunnel. So one can imagine that uh, something like an SICS may at least theoretically create more disturbance because the tunnel is much larger, but also remember it's more posterior. So you actually not hit the limbus and uh, attack the limbus as aggressively as you will do in clear corneal. So clear corneals have their pluses, but they have their minuses too. So the damage by cutting is inevitable at the primary incision. It's at least three millimeters. Then there's a couple of paracentesis that one might do. Then once my decide ki bhai LRIs bhi karni hai. So then now you have these big cuts uh, to reduce your astigmatism. This is all cutting up the cornea. And uh, uh, this is all going to add to a uh, reduction in the corneal sensitiv sensitivity irrespective of the incision type. And then the mechanism of dry eye, as I've just uh, uh, told you a little while earlier, comes into play. Then there are the other factors. There's the prolonged microscope light exposure time, which dries up the cornea. There are uses of these various speculums, which squeeze open, the, especially if the lids are very tight and one is trying very hard to open this. One is actually attacking the lids, so you don't know what you are doing to the, to the meibomian glands and the lid structure when you're doing that. And then the energy, which is related from the, uh, from the FACO machine, uh, especially if it's a lower end FACO machine. So it's important that this visual cycles of inflammation is kept in mind. The surface irritation, the recruitment of these uh, various cytokines as well as the cell, cell mediated uh, things and the hyper evaporative changes in the tear film. Okay. There's goblet cell loss too. These goblet cells produce the mucinous component of the tear film and these convert the corneal surface from a hydrophobic to a hydrophilic surface and allow the tear film to adhere to the corneal surface but these cell densities reduce after cataract surgery, so there's a reduction in your mucus. There's MGD dysfunction as well, and uh, even at three months post-operatively, the MGD may persist and can contribute to your dry eye symptoms, even though you may think the TBUT and the S, uh, the Shermers has come back to normal, but the MGD, if you stain these patients, you'll still find ocular surface staining even after many months, and if you look at them carefully, they all have either an MGD or a blepharitis. Okay, so pre-op dry eye and its impact on post-operative outcomes. So 80% of patients undergoing cataract surgery have at least one abnormal dry eye parameter before surgery. 77 of patients have positive corneal staining and 63% of patients have TBUTs of five seconds before or less before cataract surgery. So these are, uh, you know, eye openers uh, because these older patients are all having a pre-operative dry eye and sometimes for refractive surgery, we often talk about spending time and improving the ocular surface uh, to get better outcomes. But in cataract surgery, we don't talk about it as much. But remember, this is now an era where you're going to be doing premium IOLs uh, more and more commonly. If your uh, pre-operative uh, uh, dry eye is not addressed, you're going to get much poorer outcomes. And especially if you're putting in multifocals. So the preoperative dry eye status plays a significant role in determining the ocular surface and the tear film changes. And uh, the potential for inaccurate biometry and corneal topo topographic assessments is there. MGD is common before the surgery and can continue afterwards. You will exacerbate the dry eye definitely after the surgery. So aggressive preoperative dry eye management is required in all these patients. What are the steps to reduce the postoperative dry eye? This is a whole chart. One can look for preoperative interoperative to limit the incisional damage, limit the amount of drops you put in, limit the amount of repeated drying that you do, limit the phototoxicity, and limit the surgical trauma. These are all the things that one can do uh, while we are operating these patients. And of course, there is the whole set of treatments later. The ocular surface management is just like management of any dry eye patient with topical steroids, topical cyclosporin, and NSAIDs, and lubricants. There can be the use of thermal pulsation therapy, mucin secretagogues, and of course, uh, lubricants and copious lubricants at that, as far as possible, preservative free. Uh, and you all know the DUCE 2 recommendations, uh, step one, step two, step three, and step four, if, and you go up that ladder as the requirement is there. 
Now, when we talk about hyaluronic acid specifically, especially when you combine it with HP Goar, and these are my last couple of slides, uh, the hyaluronic acid is an extremely hygroscopic molecule and has the capacity to retain lots and lots of water. And that's what is required when you're trying to deliver something to the ocular surface. You need a great degree of water on it. So a long-lasting matrix shields the eye because it provides advanced hydration and protection. And uh, the HP Guar acts as a bandage to allow the healing of the damaged cells on the ocular surface and promotes corneal reepithelialization. So that is something that's very important because there are these uh, ligands and there are certain HLAs that are uh, expressed on the damaged epithelial cells to which the sodium hyaluronate will attach. So the HA and HP GOAR combination helps with better moisture retention, reduces ocular surface friction. The improvement is better, better versus no artificial tears or only post-operative uh, HP GOAR. And uh, the demulsants PG and PEG ensure significantly longer ocular residence and there's inc improved ocular reepithelialization compared to other drops which contain HA only. So if one uh, gives them a questionnaire and tries to do, a, do an, uh, a comparison between three different types of drops, one will find that uh, those where no preoperative uh, uh, lubricant is used versus where HAHP GUAR is used versus where HAHP GUAR is used three times a day for at least two postoperative months, and that's by far uh, the kind of period for which these drops would need to go on in these patients. So to conclude, dry eye is very common following cataract surgery. It can have a negative impact on the patient perception as well as the outcomes, and it is essential to treat a dry eye. It could be present before the surgery, so you should never disregard that possibility, and preoperative dry eye may worsen, nay, will worsen postoperatively. Diagnosing and treating a dry eye before surgery is certainly beneficial. Artificial tears and those which contain HA, uh, which are well, HA base, are probably more helpful in optimizing the ocular surface and reducing the symptoms. So thanks very much. I'll be very happy to take any questions. I'm here as well uh, on the dais, and while Ritu will be giving us her talk, um, any questions at all on this or the previous uh, talk on full thickness grafts? I know it's late in the evening, so it's uh, tough to have a long day and try and absorb all this information coming at you. Uh, so all the best, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ritu Aroda, who is uh, the dean at the Bolana Zad, and she's the professor in, of ophthalmology at the Guru Nanak Eye Center. She's a prolific uh, corneal surgeon, as well as uh, a dear friend and a batchmate and colleague. So lots. So, <laughs> huh? Lots. <laughs> So I think, isko correct kare? Uh, I'll be taking you through the OSCEs, okay? So how many of you are actually DNB students? And how many are like MS, second year, third year, remaining? Oh, far too many. Okay, okay, okay. So, though I'm taking OSCE, so it's like a mock exam. And of course, I, I know MD, MS students don't go through it, but um, DNB students do go through it. And uh, you have 20 stations, right? And you are covering cornea, I mean, basically whole of ophthalmology. And uh, we prepare OSCE and what we expect from you, right? So you'll be shown a typical picture, clinical picture. You might be shown an investigation. You might be shown an investigation result. And the questions usually which are framed, uh, we try to make them that there should not be any ambiguity, okay? So it's to be like crystal clear uh, answers, but sometimes, you know, in medicine it's not there. But, uh, and we mark your questions, you know, in that manner. So I, I've prepared about 11 OSCEs in cornea right now, and I'll be questioning you. Okay, so be okay when I'm going to walk you through those questions, okay? 
Now, you will get a spot which is like this. Anybody volunteers and come here. We've recently had a question, uh, you know, session on iBanking. Don't feel, you know, scared or anything. Let's, let's clear our doubts, each other. This is, what do you think is the first picture A and B showing? And what do you think, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching also along with it. And what do you think the picture C and D is showing? What are A and B showing? Anybody? Slit image of? Slit image of the donor cornea. Great. And C and D? Specular of the donor cornea. So now, now that you've said it's a slit picture, now tell me, grade the structure which is shown in A and B clinically. Clinically, when I may not have a specular, it's good to have a specular, but it's basically belonging to the same patient, same tissue. So anybody wants to come up and tell me what, what are the features you are showing in this slit picture of the donor cornea? Anybody? This is how the cornea, of course you get a, Somshila is also there, so you can correct me if I am wrong anywhere, you know. So there is, you'll definitely get a glass picture. So what I'm trying to say is that of course you will be answering this, but what is more important is to pick up that skill. That tomorrow if I get a cornea, how I have to evaluate it. That's what we are trying to assess through this OSCE, okay? You'll get a slit of the glass you'll get a slit of the cornea, okay? So that's what, you know, we've tried to take the picture in that manner. So what are you trying to say if this, you know, because I've got this cornea, I do not know whether I should be using this cornea at all or I should be using it for an optical keratoplasty, therapeutic keratoplasty, lamellar keratoplasty or, uh, you know, the other kind of endothelial keratoplasties. So that's what we are trying to gauge this cornea. So anybody? Come on. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, yes. So, you know, though I have written great, so, so here you are covering part two also. Okay, so two salient features. So what are the two salient features? You've already mentioned them. What are the two salient features? Let's see. Okay, yes, 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 Okay, okay, okay. And so what will you write the grading for? No, no, grading is, is it a good tissue, excellent tissue, poor tissue? A means what A is different according to different. No? It will be very good to excellent, right? So what is the most, I, I've actually, I've written the answers also over here, which I have <laughs> just now deleted them. That's why you're getting that spacing. here. So what's the most, and this is the specular which you are getting for this. So what would be the most likely use of this tissue? Now, now look at the count. Of course, optical is a very big variety. Lamellar means what? You will use this tissue for anterior lamellar? Actually, they, they didn't have a class on lamellar <laughs> keratoplasty. That's why they are answering like that. You are right. Optical penetrating keratoplasty is what Dr. Rishi dealt with. And now is the era when he said that the number of penetrating keratoplasties are going down. Isn't it? So lamellar keratoplasties are of what types? Anterior and posterior. So posterior lamellar keratoplasty further? DSEC or DMEC, right? So when you get this kind of a tissue, this kind of a report, you will use this tissue for? I mean, optical is there. That is a wide variety. But it is this kind of a tissue 
which you will, therefore I will most likely use. You will prefer it for DSEC, oblique, DMEC. That's the answer we are expecting from you. We don't want you to write optical PK. This is obvious it's optical PK. That's why I showed a tissue which has got an excellent endothelial count. You can make it out. Okay? So, of course, if I don't have a patient or I do not know how to do post endothelial transplant, I will use it for optical PK. I can use it for therapeutic also. Nobody's stopping me. But uh, it's, it's like most likely use. So, you know, every spot which you get, I think is a marked uh, five or six, you know, I'm forgetting. And uh, there is a particular time, or maybe four marks, four marks, yes. I, 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 I need to be corrected on that. So, but then, Oski, yes. Five marks each. And uh, I was confusing with the time. Because the time also you get there, I think, is four minutes or six minutes, you know. Sometimes if the spots are very clear cut, we make two spots for that, A and B, you know. So, so you have to be, like, absolutely on the dot for that. So this whole thing will be put in for five marks, and that's how you go on, okay? So that's the first part uh, which we clear. Now, this is a surgery which I'm going to play this video. You do get a video also, okay? I'm going to play the video, look at the video, and then you answer these questions. Okay? We've just shown you 10 seconds video. Now look at the question. What step and in which surgery is <coughs> being done? What step has been done? <laughs> yes? So that's what we need you to write. That's meth members. Second question. What is the indication for this surgery? DMEC? PBK, okay, I should have refined the question and saying, give me two indications, absolute indications. Okay? Third, what stain has been used? And what instrument has been used to perform this? So that's how, you know, so we made it very simple. So similarly, we will take those video shots of different surgeries, specific step, and ask you why this has been done or what has been used, it may be, I mean, for cornea, glaucoma, retina, we can pick up from anything. And then so, which means that you should have my assisted the surgery, done the surgery, and go on. Now let's go to the next one. Now read the question. A and B, okay, the top two. They are the presentations of a particular condition. The scraping from this sample is there in C. <coughs> Tell me, identify the stain which has been used. There is stain and the concentration. Because everybody will answer ZN, so therefore we wanted to know the answer for that. 20%. Check it up. And name one other stain which can be used. Sorry, gram. Name the organism and dis first is describe the morphology. Describe the morphology of this. Sorry? Is it gram positive? This is gram-negative bacilli? Yes. Put the two things together. Put the That's exactly what I'm saying. So, up change will change. He says, yes. If you said gram-negative bacilli, then what is this? What is the commonest gram-negative bacilli? 
अभी आपकी क्लास हुई इन्फेक्टिव कैरेटाइटिस की सूडोमनास होता सूडोमनास की कॉर्निया की पिक्चर ऐसी होती है नहीं होती ना ऐसी सो यू विल गेट इफ यू आर गेटिंग अ कॉर्निया पिक्चर लाइक दैट स्क्रेपिंग फ्रॉम देयर इज लाइक दिस तो ये क्या देख रहा है आपको नोकाडिया स्ट्रेट अवे नोकाडिया बोलूँ तो यू दैट्स वाई वी आर आस्किंग यू डिस्क्राइब दी ऑर्गेनिज्म इज नोकाडिया मोफोलॉजी बताओगे उसने बताया जील नीलसन ए एफ बी स्टेन बताया ना उसने सो देन यू हैव टू गो अकॉर्डिंगली एंड डिस्क्राइब द क्लिनिकल पिक्चर इसका क्लिनिकल पिक्चर क्या बोलोगे इसके कैरेटाइटिस के लिए रीथ लाइक बैट वॉट्स अ ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस हेयर सिंपली राइटिंग एमिकस इन विल नॉट वर्क वेन आंसर अ सिंपल वी वॉन्ट एग्जैक्ट आंसर वी बेटे फोर्टिफाइड से काम नहीं बनेगा इट्स दिस कंडीशन इट्स दिस कंडीशन एमिकस इन ठीक बोला था बट उसकी परसेंटेज लिखनी जरूरी है उसके साथ में हाँ कितनी होती है वन परसेंट होती है या टू पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट होती है सॉरी टू पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट होती है सो दैट इज वॉट वुड बी नीडेड फ्रॉम यू अगर आपने सिंपल अमेरिका से लिख के छोड़ दिया नो मार्क्स ओके ओके सो दिस इज वॉट वॉज द आंसर वन परसेंट ओके नाउ सी दीज टोपोग्राफीज वेरी क्लियरली दीज आर द टू टोपोग्राफीज ए एंड बी ऑफ पेशेंट्स हु हैव अंडरगॉन रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरीज यू हैव टू आइडेंटिफाई and these are my patients only so i can put it identify a and identify b soch lo time le lo nahi dikh raha to bolo main magnify kar deti hu hmm mujhe pooche mai tumko isme se value padh ke bata deti hu anybody coming up do you have a class here on topographies है क्लास है तुम्हारा लेक्चर था टोपोग्राफीज पे या नहीं है कम ऑन क्या दिख रहा है आपको इस वर्ष वाली पिक्चर में क्या दिख रहा है ये वाला पिक्चर में ये क्या दिख रहा है इतना टाइम नहीं मिलता है क्या कैसे बोला तुमने स्माइल इसकी थिनेस जो आ रही है 600 आ रही है नहीं नहीं ये सेम पेशेंट नहीं है ये दो डिफरेंट पेशेंट्स हैं ये दो डिफरेंट मेरी और सोमशिला की रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरी हुई है एक का ये पिक्चर है एक का वो पिक्चर है बेटा रिफ्रैक्टिव हुआ है कम ऑन फिर मुझे मालूम चलेगा कि तुम कितना टोपोग्राफी इंटरप्रेट करते हो कैसे करते हो पोस्ट माओपिया तो बेटा क्या से क्या रिफ्रैक्टिव प्रोसीजर हुआ है कॉमनली माओपिया के लिए तो होता है रिफ्रैक्टिव हाँ ऐसे लिखोगे आंसर तो जीरो आएगा बता दो मेरे को मैं तुमको बता देती हूँ कॉर्नियल थिकनेस इसकी जो है ना यहाँ पे फोकस नहीं आ रहा है अच्छा बट ये सेंटर वाला जो है और बाय द वे वो भी वो भी रिफ्रैक्टिव प्रोसीजर हुआ हुआ है उसमें भी वो भी देख लो तुम ये भी रिफ्रैक्टिव है और ये भी रिफ्रैक्टिव है इसमें क्या नजर आ रहा है आपको ये एंटीरियर एलिवेशन मैप पोस्टीरियर एलिवेशन मैप अगर तुमको मालूम हो ऑफ स्कैन में दिस इज कर्वेशनल मैप दिस इज अ थिकनेस मैप ओके आई होप यू ऑल नो अबाउट इट ठीक है तो इसमें क्या आ रहा है आपको ये जो सेंटर में एंटीरियर एलिवेशन क्या है ये सेंटर ये एलिवेशन क्या है एलिवेटेड है फ्लैटेंड है तो ऑब्वियसली रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरी करी है ना हुई है जो भी है और ये क्या है व्हाट इज दिस क्या ये स्टीपनिंग हुई है ठीक है तो इन ट्रेडिशनली ऐसे कॉर्निया को क्या बोलते हैं इट्स नॉट पार्ट ऑफ दिस क्वेश्चन बट जस्ट टू ऑबलेट कॉर्निया ओके बाय द वे जो थिकनेस है इसकी सेंटर में 600 है 
अब कैसे हो गया भैया मायोपिया की रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरी करी और सेंटर में तुम्हारा छह सौ आ रहा है मायोपिया में रिफ्रैक्टिव के बाद कम जाती है ना है ना दिस इज दिस इज और ये वाला जो है वो तुम देख रहे हो वो भी मैं तुमको बता रही हूँ सेंटर में रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरी हुई हुई है ये जो है सेंटर में जो तुम्हारा ये वाला है ये तो तुम्हारा देखो सेंटर में 46, 48 पर रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरी हुई है ठीक है वेल दिस इज वॉट यू हैव पोस्ट आर के कॉर्निया यू अंडरस्टैंड द रीजन हेयर दिस इज डेफिनेटली एलोवेटेड आप ये देखो यू माइट बी इन सेटअप वेर लॉट ऑफ दीज रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरीज आर बिंग डन सी The topography is post myopia refractive surgery. You will see the periphery uh, beyond central six millimeter. There is a steepening happening, but that steepening is regular. जो आपका center का flattening होता है is absolutely circular. This is not absolutely circular. You are seeing the area which is steep and hair, steep and hair, steep and hair. same thing in the posterior hair you are seeing and i am giving you hints again and again that central cornea is normal thickness this is post rk cornea and what is this ye center mein steep ho gaya center mein steep kab ho jata hai refractive surgery hui hui hai iski thickness kitni hai 561 This is hyperopic LASIK. This is post hyperopic LASIK. That's why you see, see how nicely circular. This is what I'm trying to tell you. When you will use a laser, you will get very well defined zone, and that's why the center has steepened. So, effectively, by showing you this spot, we are trying to assess you. whether you can read your topography charts well or not you will be given fields you will be given octs so it's not only one exam point of view in general to interpret it what it is okay now let's go on to the next one this is a 45 year old lady now dr rishi has talked about keratoplasty okay the she presented with pain redness watering 3 years after coronagraph we talked about complications okay 3 years after coronagraph so first thing is you should uh, first i would like to ask you what do you think normally when we see a picture like this what there is only one diagnosis in this yeah somebody said that very good so the commonest so i anyways written out here <laughs> yeah so i forgot to morph it so the most likely diagnosis suture related ick okay and uh, if you really take and if i ask you how will you interpret this you should be knowing how to interpret these uh, histopath slides also okay and the organism and what is the next line of management so through this i am trying to assess the complication of keratoplasty which is in this case ick okay and uh, i think this will be a little high for you so i'm just leaving this okay this is not cataract this is not cornea but this is actually one of our patients therefore i put it like that by the way 90% of the slides were our patients so what i am trying to guess is that start seeing your patients well this is a person whose right eye is like this and this lady has presented 45 year old lady 618 vision 2 years after having undergone a cataract surgery 2 years after undergone a cataract surgery she has presented like this so what do you think is the diagnosis is os subluxated iol okay 
What do you think is the most likely cause in this? Sorry? Zonular laxity. Why will a zonular laxity? Obviously, it's zonular laxity. But due to what? Put two and two together. Put two and two together. Yeah. So that's why I have put this OD picture along with it. Okay? So uh, this obviously is showing you pseudo X. So here what we expect from you, the cause for this condition is pseudo X. Okay? And how will you manage her? How will you manage her? Can you put CTR in this? Bhagwan bhi aajayega, toh bhi nahi CTR dal sakta is. Huh? Okay? So either you will do a sutured IOL, I mean one has to see as a sutured IOL or AC IOL, right? Agar ab, mala, bo khol sakte ho. But and, and in this, suppose I give you this spot. What two, two precautions will you take when you're up doing a cataract in this patient, OD wala eye? What are you doing? 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 What are one is exactly, she hit the nail. What you expect is a poorly dilating pupil. And second, zonal laxity. So you will take precautions for those. Wo important leke chalo. Baki low fake or low bottle light means you don't know. So, okay, let's go again. Now, this is again one of our patients. So I put it like this. Are, 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 I have answer bhi diya. I shouldn't have written the answer. <laughs> Maybe I was too exuberant. Now, this is a young girl, 21 year old. Okay? She presented to us like this. And this was the eye for her. She was PL negative in this left eye. So tell me, of course, the diagnosis here is very clear. So I have not asked you anything about diagnosis because I, I know the diagnosis is very clear in this patient. So, if you know the diagnosis, so what are the likely corneal lesions you get if you know the diagnosis? So that's the answer which one expects from you. You know, I would have written that give me two likely corneal lesions or three likely corneal lesions. Now, can anybody sit and explain to me why this patient is PL negative? Does this do, and this is off the thing. But this is typically, I mean, I have my ward rounds and all, ward round teaching. So in ward round, this patient presented to us was PL negative. Have you seen herpes zoster patients PL negative? This is a I like. And let me see if how much of you, you, you use your brain, use your brain. Patient ab yun aya hai. Optic nerve involvement is not going to be able to do anything. I will tell you that it is not going to be able to do anything. I will tell you that it is not going to be able to do anything. And it is not going to be able to do anything. Intentionally. I will tell you that it is not going to be able to do anything. And it is not going to be able to Principles of management. This patient, do you think is an active zoster? Okay. What is the principle of management in this case? What do you patient? I don't know what you're saying. Is it oral antiviral? This patient, as I said, it's not active. He already took it. ये already मतलब तुम देखोगे लगता है तुम्हें कि एक हफ्ता पुराना या चार दिन पुराना कितना पुराना होगा ये use your clinical skill बड़े doctor बन रहे हो doctor so go on so so 
ये ये कितना पुराना होगा है ना स्कैप बने हुए हैं इसके इसके देखो कितनी अल्सरेशन हुई हुई है एंड दिस इफ यू एंड आई एम गिविंग यू द हिंट पी एल नेगेटिव ये फोटो इतना अच्छा नहीं आया बट दिस पेशेंट एक्चुअली हैड समथिंग लाइक एंड ऑफ दलमाइटिस ऑल्सो यू नो सो दे फॉर आई एम नॉट आस्ट यू एनी क्वेश्चन रिलेटेड टू दैट तो क्या करोगे you will rule out hiv in this patient that's the first thing and that's what we did and patient was hiv positive she didn't disclose to us so when the patient presented to us had already taken treat therefore i have written principle of management rather it's a dictum any zoster patient coming you have to rule out immunocompromised status so the patient had cd4 count only 100 that's why you are getting so you have to see the intensity roj zoster dekhte ho na to principle of management kya hai principle of management theek hai maine oral antiviral likha but wo broad hai but is patient mein simple antiviral deke kuch nahi hoga tumne patient theek karna oski to hota rahega patient theek karna isn't it ultimately to mariz theek karna hota hai na so you would like the to you may give steroids you therefore i have written investigate you would like to a lot of them have underlying mdrs tuberculosis you want to rule it out and then i will i may ask you a question related to that zoster unrelated what was the aim or the purpose of zoster i disease study anybody i can ask any spot and i can ask any study or trial which is important well known and kis purpose se zoster i disease study hui thi anybody wo ho gaya na na zo zoster antiviral beta tum simplex se confuse kar rahe ho tum hepatic i disease study se confuse kar rahe ho हेड्स की बात कर रहे हो मैं जोस्टर आइस की बात कर रही लुक इट अप दिस वॉज जस्ट अ सैम्पल पेपर लुक इट अप सो द आंसर वॉज दिस मैंने लिखा हुआ है वेदर प्रोलॉन्ग सप्रेसिव वेल साइक्लोवर ट्रीटमेंट रिड्यूज द कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ हपी जोस्टर ऑफ थैलमेटस दिस वॉज द पर्पस सो इन नेचुरल यू विल गेट अ स्पॉट यू विल गेट कि इसके नीचे कोई रिलेटेड कोई ट्रायल कोई स्टडी यू कैन बी आस्ट रिलेटेड टू दैट ओके नाउ दिस इज अनदर ऑफ अ पेशेंट्स दिस इज अ क्लिनिकल टाइम हो गया क्लिनिकल फोटो ऑफ दिस इज अ 72 ईयर ओल्ड मेल ही इज ऑलरेडी अंडर गॉन अ प्रोसीजर एंड ही इज प्रेजेंटेड टू अस and this is the auto ref for this patient this is a keratometry for this patient so what do you think is uh, is a diagnosis for this patient he is undergone some procedure if i will name that procedure diagnosis asana hai isliye maine nahi bola hai iska ek procedure ho chuka hai dekho dhyan se dekho kya dikh raha hai aapko what's the finding ये पंक्टम नजर आ रहा है सबको सिंपल फ्रॉन किसी ने पिकअप कर लिया एंड सो दिस पेशेंट इज एक्चुअली टूरिज्म ही ऑलरेडी अंडर गॉन अ प्रोसीजर इज वेरी क्लियर एक्चुअली एंड दिस इज वन ऑफ अर पेशेंट वॉट इज दी वॉट यू थिंक वुड बी लाइकली कंप्लेन ऑफ दिस पेशेंट आई एम गोइंग उल्टा आई कैन आस्क यू उल्टा ऑल्सो अरे छोड़ो क्या तुम्हारी टड़ी जी भी क्लास नहीं हुई यहाँ पे डिमिनेशन ऑफ विजन तो है ही है और बताओ इम्पोर्टेंट वो तो कोई भी बता देगा सो दॉमनेस्ट प्रॉब्लम दिस पेशेंट हैज बेटा दिमाग लगाओ लैटरल गेज में उसकी आंख जाएगी सो so, डिप्लोपिया He may not have diplopia agar uski vision kam hai, but commonest problem is diplopia and reduced vision. Okay, and next of course I will ask you plan of management. So that's how we divide 
our questions, you know. Kibi, so effectively, I've asked you a complete thing about a region. Now, let's see. So, yeah. Now, this is a clinical presentation of a patient six hours after firecracker injury, ODOS. Okay? So you have to tell me what are the important findings here. Raje, che ghante mein persistent epithelial defect ho jayega. Che ghanta likha hai mene upar. So ye bolo na, total epithelial defect, large epithelial defect, this is also near total epithelial defect. What else? Ke what I'm trying to assess through this is that your chemical burns, what is your knowledge? If you have an acute patient, you have to see what you have to see in 4-5 things. So, what is your limbus in the limbus? Huh? Where did you look at this? Where did you look at this? Where did you look at this? Oh, son, look at this. Son, it's so much vascularity in this case. Huh? So this is just a simple epithelial defect. And limbus is preserved. Limbus is preserved. Now I have given it in a big mag, in a small mag, so it's going to get out of the bottom. So then that's why I will go back and ask you, what is the grade of the burn? Now I have given you the answer. So what is the grade of the burn? रोज रटे रटे मार रहे होते हो दुआज क्लासिफिकेशन रोपर हॉल क्लासिफिकेशन अप्लाई करो इसको इसमें तो प्रोग्नोसिस क्या होगा फिर उसका हाँ सो एक्सेलेंट प्रोग्नोसिस बिकॉज़ दिस इज़ जस्ट ग्रेड वन तो लाइक दैट वी विल गो एंड आस्क यू नाउ ऑफ़ कोर्स आई आई ऑपरेटेड दिस पेशेंट टुडे इसलिए मैंने को अच्छा लगा इ this is, of course, what both of you have taken from this. OD and this was the OS of a patient. 65-year-old, he had a diminished vision in the right eye. Two years, and in the left, there was no surgery. So what is it? Tell me the diagnosis. What is the complete diagnosis of the right eye? Tell me, tell me, tell me. It's all silent at the back. Yes, but the right eye is not silent. Yes, it's 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 silent. Yes, ठीक है बोला उसने इसलिए मैं उसकी बजा रही इधर and so or you will say double headed and then you will tell me manage कैसे करोगे manage कैसे करोगे so you will excise it you will put amniotic membrane or and you will do a slit Okay? Doctor, anything you want to differ? You want to say something, Doctor? So I think I've come to the end. So that was just an overview of... Sir, my mind is very much in this. It's gone. Thank you very much. So now I invite Dr. Somshila. Are you here? Where are you going? So she is heading the cornea, anterior segment, everything in LVPI. And she is excellent in all what she does. And she is also looking after immunology, isn't it? You are looking after it. And uveitis. So welcome. So let's go on to her session. 
Thank you very much. Uh, very good evening to everyone. I'm Somshila Murthy, and uh, as uh, it's a very, very tough act to follow after such a wonderful uh, interactive session. So mine is also supposed to be interactive session. And I thought I'm a funny person, but Madam, you to matlab kuch aari. <laughs> Next level. I think, I think you woke up everyone, uh, and it was a very tiring day. So anyone wants to stand and stretch, you can do that. You can stand. I can always take a picture and say I had a standing ovation. Like people are <laughs> so what I'm going to do is take you through some more Konya, some more and more and more. And it's going to be repetition because people have taken some of these topics. OK, but what I'm not going to do is have mass yelling. So nobody understands anything. OK, so we have some hot seaters and some cold seaters. Is that what you so you know, no, when you're sitting on a hot seat, kya hota hai? when you're sitting on a cold seat, kya hota hai? Uh, so, so what we're going to do in order for the answers to come out, we're going to go row wise. OK. And sir, you won't ask anything. Then the whole presentation will be finished in five minutes. So we'll ask, uh, are you a, you're a participant? Yeah. So we'll ask the first row, including you, over there. You get first cut. The rest of the OK, and then we go on to the first row on this side. And then we go on to second row, and so on and so forth. All right? And those of you who want to answer, there's so many seats here. You come here, you get a chance. There are three things that you should learn in, when you're so young in your career. Wake up early. Who's not a morning person? Who's not a morning person? But who wakes up early? Just less than half. Who is lying? <laughs> OK. So make it a habit to wake up early. It's, it's proven many, many studies, a lot of things that you get up early in the morning, your, your productivity is much better. So even if you're not a morning person, like I'm not, make it a habit to get up early. Second thing is, don't be backbenchers. Don't be backbenchers because you're missing out. Your attention is divided. All of you are making an effort to come to this course. And so by being there, you know, your attention is, it may not be your primary interest, but whatever interest you have, you're losing out. So I would suggest that all of you, I'm going to take a two minutes from my presentation, already timer is on, so the more time you take, to have everybody come down. All the seats should be full. May I request everybody to come down? Whoever's sitting in the back benches, please come down. Because we're taking it row-wise, so I want all the rows to be full. And everybody is going to be hot seaters. All right? So yeah, good. You get a chance to stretch also. And you can use these mics if you have And you can use the mics if you have some burning questions or the seat is too hot. OK, good. Thank you. Still some more backbenchers. There's still a lot of seats in the front. Come, 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 come. We'll wait. It's your loss. So yesterday night, I reached home at around uh, 1 o'clock. And uh, so I requested not to be in the morning session. I knew that today I can't get up early enough. But I got up, and I got ready, and took my flight only to be with you guys. Yeah, and I have another commitment today, which I said that this is the most important commitment for me for today. So yeah. if no, 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 no. What I'm saying is that if I can do this, you can definitely pay attention and come to the bottom. I demand that. Ma'am is traveling all the way from Malaysia. She has directly come. And please just cooperate a little bit. She was supposed to be in a GBM. And she is standing right here in front of all of you guys. So please cooperate and interact as much as you can and benefit out of it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> OK, now I sound like a very hard taskmaster. OK, fine. So just to take you through, uh, so my topic was long and short cases in Konya. So it's supposed to be interactive. And when I was thinking, because I gave my PG exams like a million years ago, maybe, something like that. So I just didn't recall. So what I do is, what I did is, and I do take the exams occasionally when they trap me to take the exams. But I didn't think of it from the student's perspective. So what I did is I asked our DNB coordinator, I asked a lot of fellows who had just finished their exams, so they finished exams. And then I asked the residents who are preparing for exams. I got different answers from everyone. So there's some common answers and some are very different. So everybody has their own idea. And now I also got some information from the examiners as well. So it seems what a common commonality, and I'm going to show you, is that 
any case can be a long case, and but certain cases preferably are going to be short cases. And during COVID times, the whole structure had to be altered. A lot, lot of OSCEs uh, came in, but now we're moving back. So it's more likely to be the traditional kind of exam. So the, the idea is to be, to be a, you know, have a beautiful case ready and present it. But examiner ko board nahi karna hai. To har ek cheez batane ki zarurat nahi hai. Positive findings should come in very fast. And you do try and be very sharp and say what the examiner is trying to ask you because they have a specific point or something that you missed out. So you have to think about that. When your exam center comes up and you know that who are the internal examiners going to be, the likely people, read up about the latest and what they have published. Because everybody who's published a lot has a lot of in-depth knowledge about that subject. So you can be very smart and try to bring that up. So we'll be happy. Okay. So traditionally, it used to be sort of four cases. So you have two long, two short, or one long, three short, something like that. But in Konya, some of the cases can be either long, can be either short. Uh, and it's more likely to have common conditions most of the time. So you'll have the simpler, whichever, whatever has been taught to you. So don't think of very weird, vague diagnosis. It's more likely to be common diagnosis. So just keep your head together and all the common things that they have been teaching to you every day, that's what it's going to be. So, so in ectasias, you may have ketoconus. Globus is rare, so you may or may not have. You may have pellucid or you may have terian. So these are the four diagnoses that can happen. If it's in a medical college, a lot of these cases would be there. If it's a smaller private institute, which is your uh, center, then you may not, you may or may not have some of these cases. But if it's a cornea specific center, like say you're going to one of the LV Prasad branches, you have your exam there, or you're going to Shankar Netralia or something, then definitely you'll have very sp more specialized cases. So think about where you're going also. But all of these are things you know. If there's a case of corneal scar, it's likely viral would be pretty high on the etiology because it's a, it's a more interesting thing. If you have scar, usko injury hua, fir scar ho gaya. What is there in that? So it's more interesting to discuss if it's viral, so epithelial, you can, you can answer epithelial, stromal, whatever. So even if it's not purely viral, you can say that this could also be viral and then take, lead the examiner to viral because there's lots to be discussed over there. So corneal dystrophies are uh, fairly common in most parts of India, so you might have dystrophies. And, and most centers, they do ketoplasties, so you'll have post-operative patients who keep coming in for follow-up. There's a good pool because patients have to keep coming in for follow-up. So be ready with can penetrating ketoplasty like was uh, uh, taught earlier. And the lamellar, we're doing more of endothelial lamellar ketoplasties like DSEC, DMEC, or we might do DALC. So DALC is a little difficult for some of us to pick up clinically. So you might just be ready with the answer. You, you know, sometimes the patient can give the history to you as well. And corneal degenerations are mostly spotters, so we keep a short case with the corneal findings, and we would just ask very quickly, like in five minutes. It's like an OSCE, but you might have a patient there. So you do a very quick examination, you just tell the positive findings and what it is about. So don't forget corneal degeneration. They're very easy to score on these cases, the spotters. And then, of course, allergy, because in all parts of India, you have a lot of patients with allergy. So this is a topic that, uh, though it's not very glamorous, but you can definitely have it as a short case or some, say a patient has a, a, a limbal nodule or a pediatric patient with, you know, the classic findings, because there's a lot to discuss. You can discuss a lot of those findings and what is the treatment and so on. And depends on the philosophy of that institute, but sometimes active infection or inflammation, they may not keep for the exams because uh, the, the patient is in, is, is in distress. So they don't want uh, you people with your inexperience to go on examining, no? I'm sure that you'll do everything for the patient. So there'll be a lot of distress. But on the other hand, what happens is that many centers will have these cases, this pool is high. So then they, they'll have a lot of infections admitted, hospitalized. So those may be the patients you might get. So whatever it is, whether or not you have a patient, don't have a patient, the examiner won't forgive you if you don't know the answers for infectious keratitis. So microbial keratitis is an important uh, uh, disease, very common, uh, vision-threatening, patients go blind. So you must know the answers to this. You cannot mess up or you, have, you cannot fall short. And then again, active PUKs may not be there. Murins is very more common in our country. So, so think of a Murins patient might be there for you. And corneal edema, you may have, especially post-operative corneal edema or PBK, Fuchs, and rarer cases like ice syndrome. So before your jaw drops, because I just about covered entire cornea, so I'm just putting this slide once again, if you want to take a picture of what all you need to read. Chalo, at least kisi ne to picture liya, meri large baj gai. Okay. 
So before we start, and this Dr. Ritu had also highlighted that cornea is cornea, but it's just part of the eye, part of one eye. What does OD stand for? Row one on this side, OD. Oh, OD full form kya hai? A right eye? Aap row one ho. What does OS stand for? Oculus, OS. Okay, and OU? Not OU. OU matlab tu. What does OU stand for? OU. How can you not know this? And which language is it originating from? Okay. So this is trivia, and if you if you all of you do so well in AIO quiz and so on, so these are the simple things that you must must know. I'm not going to answer that. So remember, cornea is part of the eye, but this, this, it's not just the it's not just cornea. You need to see that what else is there in that eye when you get a case of cornea. So for example, dry eye, ocular surface, lids, and so on, because the disease can involve even the remaining part. You saw that case of a uh, very dramatic case of uh, itzido which had involvement of the entire, right from the lid, had endophthalm mitis as well. And remember that the condition can be bilateral. So you have to examine the fellow eye, especially certain conditions, say dystrophy or um, trachoma or many other conditions can be bilateral. So you must, must examine the other eye. But the causes of certain conditions, say bilateral PUK, can be systemic. Or this patient actually has Hansen's disease, so it can be infectious cause. So you must also examine the patient because from the eye to the other eye to the body. But remember that you're not treating the cornea. You are treating the patient as a whole. So remember to do that because if you don't remember what we are here for, that is to treat the patient, not the eye, not just the eye. We are here to treat the patient. If you forget that, lose sight of that, then you can't become a good ophthalmologist. All right, so we'll go to the first case. So this case is uh, Ro, uh, where were we? So row three on this side uh, can just very quickly, I've written most of the things, but maybe anyone can just stand up so that everybody can hear you and others don't speak. So very quickly, you can just sort of come to how you would describe the case. So the first text point I've put is about the patient. So you would ask all these things and you would present this history, the patient's occupation, age, when the patient came, duration of the, the symptoms, and what was the previous treatment the patient has, had used. So very important, you're already leading the examiner saying that the patient had used topical prednisolone as well. So then you would go on to examine the patients. Uh, adnexa, very important, so examine all these causes. And then you'd describe the corneal findings. So you'll say that there's an epithelial defect, you may have stained it and seen on the slit lamp. You'll say the measurements you'll say of the infiltrate, you'll say what are the edges looking like. And then this patient in the anterior chamber has a streak hypopion. All right, so that was about the patient's uh, clinical features in one eye. So let's assume that everything else was normal and the other eye was also normal. Patient was systemically healthy. So now row three, can one of you can just answer. What's the, so now you want to come to the diagnosis. You have to tell the examiner what is your likely diagnosis. Anybody, just go ahead. It's a simple case. Okay, so your likely, so your most likely diagnosis, fungal, why fungal keratitis? Okay, maybe you can use the mic because, so history of trauma, vegetative matter. Okay, row three on that side. You want to give a differential diagnosis? I've put in so many others. So anybody from that row, what is your second diagnosis? If not fungal, can sit. If not fungal, so you're okay. So what are the points for Pythium? Very good, yeah, not healing with antifungals, what she said. Uh, what about row four on this side? Any takers for no cardia? What are the points in favor of no cardia? So you saw in the earlier re presentation by madam that you had a patient with no cardia keratitis. What are the points in favor? So what are the antecedent history for no cardia? Patient has history of? Soil going to there, yeah. So it's an agricultural worker. So that's quite possible. So that was a point in favor. What is against row four on that side? So what is against features of no cardia? 
So see that little picture here. Appearance of the edges, you don't have read like. So, but, but I would just say that these were elevated actually. That's the reason why you could put it as a differential diagnosis. So the lesions at the edge were quite thicker than the central portion. So that's why it's a differential diagnosis because it's almost like a wreath. It's not nodular looking like how you have a nocardia. It's not super elevated from the surface, but it could be a differential diagnosis. But the patient and was also using steroids but didn't flare up. So sometimes nocardia gets temporarily controlled because of steroids. And the last one I put pseudomonas. Any takers for pseudomonas? So obviously no, I just put it up there, all right? So obviously it's not pseudomonas. And so the most likely etiology, these are the points that you mentioned. So when you're examining the patient and you want to offer a, a diagnosis to the examiner, if it is not clear cut standing out there, it's good to give another differential diagnosis because the examiner will think, okay, this person is thinking about what else it could be. And it should not be something absurd, like you can't say fungal and then say pseudomonas. It should be something close by. Somebody said fungal and pythium which is a very good observation because they're very close enough differential diagnosis. Or I could have said no cardia because of the reasons that I mentioned that it is looking like this. But, but my first diagnosis, you know, I could say that, but this is my first diagnosis. So that's why you can offer a differential diagnosis before you uh, come to what you're most likely thinking about. So now row number, whichever row we are, four or five, anybody from this side can tell me that I'm the examiner. So now, so now, doctor, you've given me two differential diagnoses. You think it could be fungal or pythium. Now, how will you confirm this diagnosis? Anybody from that row? Are you from that row? So that's row number five. So we have the gentleman in a suit. So that is another very good thing, actually. So there is walk the walk. I'm digressing now, giving you my free advice. There, there's something called walk the walk. What's walk the walk is? You're an ophthalmologist or a cornea specialist or a neuro-ophthalmologist, so you walk that walk. You talk the talk. You keep yourself updated. You look at what is happening, what is latest, uh, what, is the, what is the practice guideline right now, and you look the look. You can do walk, you can walk all you like. You can talk all you want, but if you don't look the look, then you're going to lose out. So the gentleman in the suit who looks the look, no, it's a good thing. I don't know if anybody thinks it's not good. So my question was that, like the examiner saying that, you know, you've brought it down to two differentials. How will you confirm? Which is your diagnosis now? Do I have five minutes? How will you confirm? It's no mystery. Sorry? So whoever speaks can just stand up so that it's not, uh, yeah, sure. Exactly. Which investigation? No, no. What is KOH? KOH? What do I do? What do I do? Exactly. So your answer is that I will do corneal scraping. Yeah. And then what do you... So you cannot say that... You cannot give an answer saying, I cannot exclude pythium. I cannot exclude no cardio. You can exclude all of them. So what is the final diagnosis? So your answer, as you said, is that I will... I think it's most likely fungal versus pythium. These are my points for fungus. These are my points for pythium. And I would do corneal scraping. And then, um, so in this particular patient, corneal scrapings actually reveal uh, a fil pythium filaments. But, uh, but maybe the examiner might immediately jump and ask you, so what is the best way to identify fung which is the best, what would you do? Would you do grams, what would you do? So then your answer, obviously, you should have read up and it would be that I would do 10% KOH stain and if, I, and if I have a fluorescent microscope, I could use calcoflow white and I will have beautifully, I can see whether it's fungus or it's pythium. In pythium, as you know, that the, they are ribbon-like, very elongated filaments, hardly any septae, and they're folded on itself. Whereas fungus traditionally will have the septae, the breaks in, this, in the filaments. And they, the pythium is not a fungus at all. And that's why it will not improve with antifungals because of a difference in its... Uh, in its wall, in its cell wall. So, the, so then if you want to really impress, you can say that if I see these are the kind of filaments I can see in fungus, I can see in pythium, and if I'm confirmed that it's pythium keratitis, then I can uh, use uh, linozoloid and topical azithromycin with oral azithromycin and so on. So with that, you're going to top the exams if you come up to this stage. Don't you think? Anyway, your examiner is not listening, so it's okay. 
good thing good thing <laughs> so the examiner also so you so when you talk, so in infection there are you know the commonest ones are bacterial fungal viral now pythium i've just added to it right you and we saw nocardia where amic acid works atypical mycobacterium also amic acid works so there are basically only five groups of drugs you need to know antifungals antivirals antibiotics are something most of us know anyway and then we talked about amic acid kind of a, you know the extra drugs you use amic acid amphotericin few of these additional drugs you need to read these in and out you need to read this for your theory as well as for your practicals so mechanism of action so you don't stumble over there so when you are asked what's the mechanism of action which group does it belong to so examiners like to ask them if you ask me back again as i don't know so because i don't remember right so so that's why you need to have the person when you say a drug's name as dr ritu said you need to immediately say the percentage also so that should be in your in your dna what is the reason for this is it because we just like to trouble you the reason for this is that when you use these medications for the patient you know that it has to be 5% you know that fortified amic acin has to be at least 2.5% sometimes you can use even 5% if you have a very severe disease or a recalcitrant disease so if you if you buying ciprofloxacin you need to know what's the concentration of ciprofloxacin so that in a pinch you can formulate it yourself so that's the reason to know the percentages of all these drugs apart from exam apart from knocking the socks off the examiner if he or she is wearing socks so then now examiner is super impressed you want it so much so examiner will ask you bonus question by usko to mujhe matlab top gold medal dilana hai to will ask you that now so you did scrapings doctor but the infection is very deep and your scrapings are negative so now what will you do please come up with the answer so you can say that if i have uh, confocal microscopy is available in some centers we can do that especially if you know that center has it you can say that and then i can also repeat scrapings once again if there is some in inflammation or infection present but then i will do corneal biopsy and if all fails then i'll do therapeutic keratoplasty so that's how you can really logically come to the step step wise all right so that i just use that a great detail in great detail i just use one case to try to talk about what i'm saying but now we'll just very quickly go through some other cases so this was an 80 year old patient who was was known as poag for the past 20 years using medications suddenly he comes with bilateral decrease in vision anybody from row 6 or 7 say maybe um, somebody with the jacket uh, can can answer that's very bright i can i mean i can spot it so i can't help it it's a spotter for me so <laughs> so diagnosed as poag present so just in the picture what do you see what am i trying to show yeah the yeah so corneal edema and dm fold very good so in the slit you have picked up the dm folds that's exactly what you see in the patient also right so when you examine the patient you will see that the cornea is absolutely cloudy and very thick uh, thickened cornea as well as the the dm shows folding very nicely so what do you think since nobody else wants to answer what do you think could be the diagnosis how would you work up now logically approach this case so you would want to ask how you all uh, so you did say suddenly drop in vision but maybe just came to some boiling point and then suddenly poof the vision is dropped right so is the onset rapid or slow is the duration short or is it months or even years so he had cataract surgery done so already your mind is working and thinking about one diagnosis and then or does it pro, is it progressing so morning is okay but by end of day it becomes worse or the other way around morning it's very blurred and by the end of the day it becomes clearer so in this case the patient said that literally overnight as he woke up from sleep he had cloudiness and then over that day by, within 24 hours his vision dropped a lot and when you examine the patient which was difficult to see there but he also had a lot of congestion and some fine keratotic precipitates so i'm literally throwing the diagnosis at you So this is an OCD just to show remarkable thickened cornea. So what do you think this patient has? So uh, anybody, any takers for Fuchs corneal Fuchs endothelial dystrophy for this patient? No. So why did you say no? So uh, maybe uh, since you just spoke, so just behind you, why do you say it's no? No to Fuchs. Please speak loudly or can you use the mic? Yeah. right very good yeah and why why you and the other reason somebody was mentioning it bilateral can happen in fuchs but it won't suddenly yeah inflammation yeah very good so fuchs is in typically non inflammatory 
unless the patient has some corneal epithelial uh, defect and then he comes in with some with a rapid uh, you know like a high symptomatology so uh, he's also on drugs so remember some unusual causes that drug can also induce corneal edema over a period of time but most likely we boil it down to viral and then if i tell you that he was using latinoprost so you know that many of the anti glaucoma medications can also predispose the patient to viral especially the pg uh, analogs so we stopped latinoprost and since we have an institute set up we also did an ac tap and we did detect vi viral dna on rt pcr this this all this is not necessary but instead we started and of course we started the patient on oral antivirals and topical steroids as well and luckily there was complete resolution so this is what you can say this is a little unusual case but the idea is that whenever you have patients with conlidema like this so this is a patient who's phakic and has conlidema patient is close to 60 years of age this is gradual before that the patient has been in follow up and before that the patient would have intermittent you know blurring of vision especially in the morning so now what is this diagnosis very good so this is fuchs endothelial dystrophy so if you look at so the other eye had less edema so let's say that you can see and visualize the endothelium better if you look at his endo endothelium what would you see gutte yeah any specific name for that gutte beaten metal appearance yeah very good so this question would be there and if you you should actually try to see that you can see that with the fort so you would maybe somebody might ask you how do you look for gutte anybody in this side so one person you can stand up and answer you're all saying correct answers one person stand up and answer me kya ho jata hai yes i'm looking at this yeah sure please get up and answer yeah sclerotic scatter what will your slit limb slit beam size be okay so not the cells wala that's what i wanted to make sure not what you use for cells it has to be a little larger and wider than that and and the the and two more things you have to say brightest illumination and the magnification yeah yeah at least 40 yeah 40 magnification and then sclerotic scatter so that yeah. but you will definitely pick up gutata which can happen even just with age it doesn't have to be dystrophy only so towards this so we'll quickly go through a few corneal dystrophies uh, this one is so in the retro you can see very nicely lot of lines latus corneal dystrophy so most of this was superficial for the patient large part so we did ptk phototherapy keratectomy we took off the top uh, 75 microns or something like that and for this patient at least it worked well for the time being it's a temporary treatment it's going to recur we know that so this is latus corneal dystrophy so again that's something like infections very easy there are a few of them only don't get confused by the tons of them written there are four or five that come to us clinically and so these are the ones you need to read you read about what are the clinical features read about the the protein or the the material that is abnormal in it and the gene that is associated with it so this is an easy way to score marks if you get this as your exam don't get confused so lattice is lattice lines which means criss cross lines uh th what is this dystrophy okay who the person who said macular why do you say macular because there are no clear intervening spaces so actually when you have advanced or a variant of granular this is the exact appearance so yeah i should have put a more traditional granular so the reason we call it granular is because i'm sure dr ritu would have said granular right away so without even looking up because of these clear areas and look at the remaining cornea so there's nothing there so the rest of the cornea is all clear is all clear yeah in in uh, macular when you look at it finally everything is involved So this is granular this is another variant of granular which is called Reese Buckler's kind of a variant of granular you can say it's the same material and you can have the so this is more convincing but i didn't put up the classic picture anyway Reese both are variants of Reese Buckler yeah yeah Reese Buckler and then so what is this dystrophy now you can see that one eye looks absolutely fine and this side there is this uh, reticular appearance do you think it's uh, granular or lattice So what's the first criteria this patient is not obviously the patient didn't read the textbook of dystrophies it's not bilateral so patient pad ke nahi aaya hai na to usi mein fail ho gaya wo so it is not bilateral therefore it is not a dystrophy right unless there's very subtle finding so so examine and examine the other right the second thing is that i'm obviously not telling you is one very good very obvious history but any guesses guesses hai to yahan ka gold medal dila dungi main 
एक जन बोलो ना खड़े होके खड़े होके बोलो गोल्ड मेडल है असली गोल्ड है उसमें वो हाँ इंटरफेस मतलब कौन सा रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरी लाइक एक चूज करो एग्जैक्टली यू हिट इट इनको गोल्ड मेडल दे दो हाँ प्लीज ओके असली गोल्ड का गोल्ड मेडल ठीक है मैं स्पॉन्सर कर दूंगी नहीं या सो इट्स नॉट अल डिस्ट्रोफी सो बिकॉज द पेशेंट डेंट रीड द टेक्सट बुक इट वॉज यूनी लैचुरल एंड ऑफकोर्स द मैसिव हिस्ट्री ऑफ हैविंग अंडर गॉन रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरी पोस्ट पी आर के हेज विच यू वेरी कॉमनली सी यू कैन ट्रीट यू कैन ईदर गिव टॉपिकल स्टीरॉयड्स और और इफ इट्स वेरी यू नो बियॉन्ड अ पॉइंट समटाइम्स द विजन कैन बी गुड इवन विद दिस मच दिस मच ऑफ हेज सो द पेशेंट इज लेस बॉर्डर डॉक्टर इज मोर बॉर्डर एंड इवेंचुअली इट विल इवन आउट और इफ इट्स वेरी वेरी मच वर्स दैन दिस दैन वी माइट हैव टू डू अ पी टी के और सम काइंड ऑफ प्रोसीजर फॉर द पेशेंट सो 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 दिस इज अ सिंपल केस विच कुड बी अ स्पॉटर फॉर यू वॉट इज दिस डिस्ट्रोफी दिस इज ऑल्सो डिस्ट्रोफी बिकॉज इज बाई लैटर लाइट इन पुट अप द अदर आई एक ही बच्चा है किसका बच्चा है वो नहीं शेड नहीं है Oh, that's a good one. This is not shed, though. It was a pediatric patient. That's why, but uh, that's a good one. We saw granular. We saw lattice. We've got third brother. Huh? Your macular, yar. Macular ko dukhi kar diya. Tum logon ne bhul gaye usko. So this is how macular dystrophy can also look like. So macular dystrophy has a lot of difference in phenotype, but wo bacha acha hai. वो टेक्स्ट बुक पढ़ के आता है इट इज बायोलैट्रल इट डज नॉट हैव क्लियर इंटरवीनिंग कॉर्निया तुम अगर क्लोजली एग्जामिन करोगे आप अगर क्लोजली एग्जामिन करोगे तो इवन द इंटरवीनिंग कॉर्निया लुक्स हेजी उसको कभी इन्फ्लेमेशन नहीं होता है अनलेस रिकर इन कॉर्नियल इरोजन या ऐसे कुछ लेवल तक आ गया पेशेंट और राइट एंड देन मोस्ट ऑफ द पैथोलॉजी लुक्स सेंट्रल बट वेन यू गो आउट यू सी इवन द पेरिफ्री द डिफ्यूजनेस विच इज द and typically in the normalish looking cornea if you do a pachymetry the cornea is slightly on the thinner side so these are all the patient textbook padh ke aata hai aur bilkul jaise textbook mein likha hai waise karke aata hai in macular dystrophy but there can be a lot of phenotypical variations meaning when you examine the patient there can be a wide spectrum but a few basic rules are always followed in these dystrophies so this is how macular corneal dystrophy can be this is another patient who had macular corneal dystrophy you can figure out because i'm telling you and also because in the periphery he ha still has that residual area had a recurrence it was again macular the dystrophic deposits only and i think we treated this by doing a sort of a keratectomy and ptk or something like that so bilateral grafts were done so you might have cases where they'll show you a corneal transplant patient that is your case and you have to figure out what was probably the primary condition patient also had a cataract Colin ectasias. You see, one eye will show you ectasia. This is a patient of advanced keratoconus, and the fellow eye of the same patient. What could it be? Eye drops. Very good. What do you do? Bolo. Not IOP lowering. Go mat bolo. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so des so you will do like a desmetopexy, yeah, or compression sutures also you can do surgically. And what is the course? What is the natural course? Yeah, it will heal. So whether you give drops or don't give drops, it will anyway heal with scarring. And then what do you do? How will you? Yeah, very good. So yeah, so that's how exactly. So that's how the discussion would go. So if you have a patient with this, so you should ketocon is another very simple diagnosis. you can also read up you should read up everything about that so just some spotters uh, i'll be wrapping up after this so what is this sorry ha band hai bhaiya usko tang mat karo wo textbook padh ke aaya hai band shape ketopathy so if you do oct what will you see i might want to ask you about oct so what will you see on oct yeah you'll see nothing on oct except that you will see the layer which is involved yeah so it's 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 just a question to challenge you and you got challenged for no reason uh, what do you think this is i've put it under degeneration it could be a delin but actually it's a peripheral furrow degeneration i'm not giving you patient history it's an elderly patient it's not staining positive with fluorescein so you'll have the patient with you so you can 
stain and see whether the, it's, it's staining. Watch out, it might pool, so don't get fooled by that. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, degenerative condition. You generally might see it in elderly individuals. And it is not PUK. It is not inflammatory. And what is this now? What degeneration? It's a corneal scar with a lot of vessels. And what degeneration you see with it? Lipid, maybe? No, no, it's not a dystrophy or anything. It's unilateral. You can see a corneal scar with vessels. Whenever you see vessels, unless there are recurrent corneal erosions, you will not have vessels in dystrophies. So you see a vascularized corneal scar, think viral, or maybe some healed microbial keratitis. And you ask recurrent episodes. And so this lipid ketopathy because of all the vessels that are feeding that scar over there. And what is this one? <coughs> what, what is it a result of? What's a putative mechanism to cause it? Backbenchers. What what's a putative mechanism? Matlab patient apne aankh mein chemical fake kiya hai kya? Kis wajeh se hota hai wo? Exactly. So it's it's an actinic damage, right? So it's actinic damage. So sun induced or UV rays induced damage. So what do you do for it? Q. Aisi chhod do. So, so that means what, what symptoms can it cause for the patient? So why do you want to treat it? Yeah, what else? So the, one of the things we are worried about in our population, perhaps it's peculiar to ours, is that uh, because they can have, it's, it can cause an athromatous ulcer, which means that just that uh, they're very brittle uh, substance which is covering it. So it's a, de it's a deposit of calcium along with spheroidal globules which are nothing but some amorphous substance, apparently, which is at the level of the Bowman's membrane. So these globules, they just detach, and focal areas ulcerate. And then the patient can get secondary microbial infection. So we've seen a lot of patients with this some kind of uh, variation of spheroidal degeneration uh, getting secondary infected. So when we see these patients, we tend to smoothen out that area so the tear wetting gets better, you won't have recurrent erosions, and you can avert, avoid that problem. Sometimes you even put a small AMG in that area just to help it heal. So this is the significance. Sometimes it can become very de devastating for the patient. So that's why we tend not to leave it alone. You have another variation of spheroidal degeneration. What is it called? Yeah, very good. CDK. So CDK is what now? Meaning what now I meant in that? Compared to this, where does that present? Where is its location? Centrally, yeah. So what is the problem with that? It decreases the vision. So how can you treat it? Pray karo. Jawab hi de koi. Treat karna hi nahi hai Yeah, good. You can do PTK. You can do a superficial catectomy also. If you don't have a laser machine. So the problem it will create is when you have to operate for the patient for cataract surgery. So your view will be impeded. Many of these patients are from rural areas, so they'll come to you much later on with very advanced uh, spheroidal. So you have to handle it in a two-step approach. So basically, you've noticed that there's a lim limited repertoire of corneal cases that may pop up for the exams. And some of these are your very core of cornea. So you have to have to study it anyway. So, so the history, examination, all those things will help, just like in any other case that you're presenting. So you have to make sure you don't annoy and infuriate the examiner. So don't take them up any path, but tell them the relative, relevant positive findings and some important negative findings. Don't go off tangent and try to get them into an area that you know, that you have studied and come. And don't forget that it's not just the corneal disease, but the, like I told you, the rest of the eye, the other eye, and the body also. So make sure that you think of something uh, apart from just the eye as well to make your examination everything comprehensive all right so so that you're not somebody like this when you see your examiner but you're somebody like this notice the gender bias <laughs> all right uh, thank you very much thank you so much Yeah, apologies, it's, uh, it's just in a very light spirit. I, have, I really don't have a gender bias. <laughs> I, love, I like everyone equally, or I torture all my students equally. Thank you, Dr. Samshila. Thank you. Very, very, very interesting. Nice. She's actually almost shown the atlas of uh, all the cornea cases. Thank you. Really top class cases.
So, um, Yes. Thank you, Ritu, ma'am. Thank you, Rishi, sir, for sparing your time. And I know that it is a very important day and you all are here with us. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. And uh, now the interesting sessions begin. And uh, that is the Grand Rounds competitive sessions. Before that, I told you that I will be mentioning something about the social aspect. So can I have the slide up, please? So I told you that let's not make it only uh, uh, studies. Let's add some fun to it. So this is the section which is going to come up in like two, three seconds, as slow as it gets. Right. So um, join the social account. I focus online. OK. And uh, these are the prizes that we have come up with. Now let me explain this one by one. So the first one is today's hot shot. So while you guys are here, Let's not make it boring. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow it starts, but I have to tell them today, right, sir? So uh, today's hot shot is basically every day you guys can take pictures, okay? Keep it quirky, whatever you would like, and post your pictures on Insta on this particular, like post your pictures on your Insta and tag at iFocus Online, okay? And also on Facebook page of iFocus Online. Okay, so you can post over there as well and over here as well. The admin will keep adding you. Best is to put it on Insta and tag at iFocus online. All right, I've already started receiving notifications for joining, so that's great. Okay, and put up your pictures and we decide which picture becomes the hot shot picture of the day. You understand that? So today's hot shot picture can be anything. Somebody yawning like, uh, like that's a very hot shot moment right now. Right? So you can go ahead and do that. Second is I focus Insta moment of the day. Okay, so this is basically any specific moment, pretty much like the hot shot, but hot shot is specifically for a person. And Insta moment can be anything. And vibe with your tribe. So this is when I know you guys have come together in teams, okay? Even if it is team of two or groups of like seven or eight, doesn't matter. So while you're having lunch or taking a break, Go ahead, take your group selfies and post them, okay? So that's bec that becomes the vibe with your tribe. And at the end of the five days, we will have the person putting up the maximum uh, posts and maximum likes, and that person becomes the iFocus influencer of the day, okay? In influencer of to iFocus 2023, fine? So that these are the fun things that we are putting up, and the prizes will be announced are sponsored by Dr. Somshila Murthy, ma'am, specifically, okay? And uh, they will be uh, announced at the end of the day, every day, okay? All right, except for the iFocus influencer, but that goes on the last day. So moving on to our Grand Rounds competition. Um, so I request the judges to be uh, taking the uh, come on dais, yeah. And uh, I'll just wait for Dr. J.K.S. Pareha, sir. He's just going to pray, uh, pay his respects. So the, the 12 people, out of the 12, one person is, I think you guys should wait out to, you know, support your uh, friends who are participating. Or not. Okay. So I'll give you five, I'll give you five minutes to stay or leave. That's fine. Try not to make noise, please. Yeah, you have to 
So I'm just going to uh, check the attendance for you guys. Sushmita Samak. Perfect. Why don't you guys just like start sitting up, right? And Pooja Kesarwani. Okay. Nishi Satish. Perfect. Rakshit Agarwal. Dr. Rakshit. Dr. Rakshit Agarwal. Perfect. Dr. Charu Maggo, okay. So Rakshit is not here, I suppose. Um, Dr. Dweej will not be presenting today. Dr. Rukaya Khan, okay. So we have lesser number of people here. Dr. Gautam Ar, perfect. Dr. Priyanka Mishra is giving her slides. Dr. Anushri, okay. Dr. Ashwita, Dr. Dimple, perfect. So, uh, all So I request the judges to please come on the dais. So, hello, hello, sir. <laughs> so I request Dr. Uh, Pareha, sir, Dr. Harsh, sir, and Dr. Rashman, sir, to please come on the stage as the judges. <laughs> so just for your information, for the speakers, uh, you have to be absolutely limited to your time, okay? A buzzer will ring after your specific time limit. So the time displays at the upper corner of your screen. You can remove the slide now, no problem, okay? So the, at the upper corner, your time limit will be, the clock will be ticking, so you'll have your estimate. If you exceed your time limit, it of course affects your scores. Okay, so the topic, uh, the time limit is for five minutes and three minutes are for the discussion. All right, so can we have the first speaker? So the first speaker is Dr. Sushmita Samak and her topic is how to change a life, a case of LSCD from whom cadaveric aloe slit was performed. So uh, just before we start, you will be judged on the basis of your content your originality and the quality, your presentation skills, and an overall impact that you have on the judges. Okay? Thank you. Let me start here. Let me just go down. Yeah. yeah, make sure I'm just re emphasizing before you start. Hello. Make sure that you stick to the time and uh, make sure that you highlight what you want to because you have very little time. All the best. Good afternoon to everyone present here. Good afternoon, judges. <laughs> Good afternoon, respected judges. Um, my name is Dr. Sushmita Samak Shri Ganesh, and today I shall be presenting a case of limbal stem cell deficiency for whom cadaveric aloe slit was performed, how to change life. A 47-year-old male, a farmer by occupation, was brought to our OPD in a wheelchair. He complains of diminution of vision in both the eyes since two years. He also complained of watering, pricking sensation, redness, and intolerance to light in both the eyes since two months. He gave a history of generalized weakness and significant weight loss since one year. There was no history of chemical or thermal injuries, no history of contact lens use or previous ocular surgeries or previous ocular infections. No history of any skin lesions, oral ulcers, or other systemic complaints. The patient did not have any other comorbidities, and uh, his treatment history was that he was on uh, lubricating eye drops, CMC, for two months, and prednisolone eye drops for two weeks, one month back, as well as cyclosporine eye drops since one week, but with no improvement of the symptoms. On personal history, he gave history of reduced appetite, but bladder and bowel movements were normal and regular. There was no history of uh, smoking or tobacco consumption, but there was history of alcohol consumption occasionally. On examination, we observed that he was thinly built, but of a moderate height, 
so he had a very low bmi of 17.8 which was underweight and he required wheelchair assistance his bp was also quite low of 90 over 60 and pulse rate of 70 beats per minute however his systemic examination revealed that cvs rs cns and per abdomen were all normal vision in both the eyes was pl positive and pr accurate in all four quadrants on ocular examination his right eye findings were as shown in the diagram uh it there was capping of meibomian gland suggestive of mgd there was congestion present as well as bite dot spot in the temporal bulba conjunctiva cornea had conjunctivalization of the cornea as well as vascularization and pannus formation from 4 to 9 o'clock position and the inferior half showed an anterior stromal haze on floor scene staining there were multiple sps in all four quadrants anterior chamber was quiet with bh grade 3 iris was normal color and pattern pupil was round regular and sluggishly reactive and lens showed a mature cataract the left eye also had similar findings of mgd congestion and bite dot spot cornea however had 360 degrees conjunctivalization uh, vascularization and pannus formation from 4 to 9 o'clock position as shown in the picture and in the diagram there was a diffuse anterior stromal opacification and fluorescein staining was present uh, showed um, multiple sps in all four quadrants anterior chamber was quiet with vh grade 3 iris was normal color and pattern and pupil was round regular and sluggishly reactive lens showed a mature cataract so we diagnosed him with right eye partial limbal stem cell deficiency and left eye total limbal stem cell deficiency with both eye presenile total cataract he was managed as follows all routine blood investigations ecg x-ray and ultrasound abdomen abdomen were done and were normal however there was an elevated esr and peripheral smear showed a normocytic hypochromic anemia so his treatment was as follows he was put on intensive lubricating eye drops of sodium hyaluronate uh, systemic nutritional deficiencies were managed such as vitamin a capsules and other multivitamin supplementations were given mgd was treated with tablet doxycycline and azithromycin eye ointment and after this treatment a limbal stem cell deficiency was managed surgically with a simple limbal epithelial transplant with cadaveric aloe slit as it in involved both the eyes Two months after slit, right eye cataract surgery SICS was done, and five months after slit, left eye SICS were done. And this was the results. At eight months post-op, the patient walked into the OPD with a smile on his face. He did not have any symptoms of watering, pricking sensation, or anything that he first presented with. He had a visual recovery of best corrected visual acuity of six nine in the right eye and six twenty four in the left eye, with improved appetite, and he had regained some weight. There was no complaints of generalized weakness. So with this case. we can see a good example of how general and systemic condition of the patient can be improved with ophthalmic treatment patient was able to work again become economically independent and functionally independent this greatly improved his psyche quality of life and overall well being as he did not rely on the support of his family members as much anymore for his basic functioning thank you great great presentation a uh, couple of points uh, very very well documented as well are there uh, are there any situations or conditions where you would not deploy this treatment or it can be done for all limbal cell deficiencies uh, so we used an allo uh, slit here because it involved both the eyes uh, ideally if it was only unilateral we would have used uh, a graft from the other eye itself and um, if the condition was worse if there was dry eye symptoms like in jogren's maybe we wouldn't have done this condition so essentially your this thing is about how uh, the patient becoming better psychologically improves him yes sir psychologically right? and systemically yeah improves. so what was the counseling given to him before even when he was not well so when he came to us he was a uh, very sick underweight and uh, we um, along with the general physician did a thorough evaluation of his condition but couldn't find any other systemic causes for uh, his well being uh, like his uh, condition so we we told him we can help him with uh, sym symptomatically because of the pricking sensation and all with our procedure and maybe give him some element of um, visual recovery after we did the cataract surgery but the fact that he improved significantly after the procedure like he regained his weight he was able to uh, because of that and because of the visual recovery he was a so farmer no, no, no fair enough and, that uh, that we all saw yes, what i'm trying to tell you is that yes. one must and especially for a lot of youngsters you know you have to give every patient hope yes sir. even when you don't know that anything is going to happen it is your hope that makes the patient so much better okay yes sir thank you sir 
Thank you, sir. That was, uh, that was Pooja. Yeah. Dr. So Pooja next Kesarwani. we have Dr. Pooja Kesarwani and her topic is perforated peripheral ulcerative keratitis treated with multilayered AMG along with glue and suture. Uh, good evening everyone. I am Dr. Pooja Kesarwani. I am presenting the case. Uh, the surgeon of the case is Dr. Neha Patel. Uh, a uh, 60-year-old male uh, resident of the Ajmer uh, uh, presented with the chief complaint of the redness, pain, blood region in the left eye for the past 10 days. The history of the present illness, the patient apparently had no symptoms 10 days back. Then he started developing the redness, pain, blood region in the left eye. It was sudden in onset, gradually progressive. There was no history of the contact lens use or the over-the-counter medicine. The patient was referred by a local ophthalmologist. The past ocular history, there was no history of of the ocular trauma, surgery, infection, past medical history, the patient was on treatment for the rheumatoid arthritis since, uh, since past seven years, and he was on the hydroxychloroquine and the methotrexate. There was no history of the diabetes, hypertension, and the inflammatory bowel disease. The family and the allergy history was not significant. The ocular examination of the left eye shows the uh, uncorrected distance visual acuity of the 2 by 60. The pinhole vision was 6 by uh, 36. Uh, the refraction was not taken. Uh, the near vision was N36. The uh, uh, digital uh, tonometry, wa uh, tonometry was avoided. The ocular adnexa appeared normal. Uh, the corneal sensation was normal. Uh, then in the left eye, uh, uh, slit lamp examination, the conjunctiva and the sclera shows the superficial and the circumciliary congestion. Uh, the cornea, ha uh, uh, cornea have the peripheral crescent shape epithelial defect with the stromal thi uh, thinning at 10 to 1 o'clock position, extending centrally, encroaching the visual axis. Uh, it was uh, 7 into 7 mm and uh, with a 0.5 into 1.5 mm desmeto seal in the supranasal part. The sidel test was negative. Uh, the anterior chamber was well formed. Uh, the iris, no abnormality was found. Uh, the pupil was round, regular, and reactive. The lens shows the uh, nuclear sclerosis in the left eye, and it was also there in the right eye. Um, uh, the fundus examination was uh, uh, not, uh, not possible because of the hazy view. Uh, then the systemic investigation uh, investigation with the patient uh, patient carried with it uh, carried with him uh, was all suggestive of the uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, the provisional diagnosis uh, made was the peripheral ulcerative keratitis with the desmato seal, uh, probably due to the uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis in the left eye, along with the immature senile cataract, uh, and, uh, and, uh, which is nuclear sclerosis grade 2 in both eyes. Uh, then the differential diagnosis was made uh, or autoimmune causes, uh, Muren's ulcer, infectious peripheral uh, corneal ulceration, non-inflammatory degenerative thinning, inflammatory disorders, uh, and the peripheral corneal ulcer due to the mechanical causes. Uh, then the treatment option included the tissue adhesive with the bandage contact lens, amniotic membrane graft, tenens graft, patch graft, which can be lamellar or the full thickness. Uh, the treatment of the choice which was made was uh, multi-layered amniotic membrane graft with glue along with, uh, with uh, fibrin glue along with the overlay sutures. Uh, the supportive treatment uh, preoperatively was given the eye drop chloramphenicol plus polymexin B sulfate, uh, eye drop atropin 1%, carboxymethyl cellulose 1%, tablet doxycycline 100 mg BD, uh, tablet acetazolamide 250 mg OD, tablet vitamin C 500 mg BD, and the post-operative uh, period uh, we also added the uh, tobramycin and the dexamethasone along with the Rest, uh, rest of the ABO medication. Uh, then the intraoperative procedures, uh, we first uh, did the con uh, conjunctival resection along the area of the thinning. Uh, after that, we, uh, we did the epithelial debridement in order to uh, glue to adhere. Uh, then uh, we, di uh, we, uh, we did the peeling of the uh, amniotic membrane graft. Uh, after that, uh, we applied the glue at the area of the thinning uh, and the desmetocil. Uh, then after that, uh, we have uh, fashioned, the, uh, fashioned the single layer of the AMG uh, over the area uh, 
over the area where we applied the glue. Uh, then after that, uh, uh, we have. Uh, 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 we have taken the uh, another uh, uh, AMG graft and we have folded it into in the form of the bundle. Uh, then uh, we have applied it uh, over the single layer of the AMG graft and the, uh, then we secured the graft with the overlay sutures and then uh, we put the BCL over it. Uh, then this is the uh, uh, first post of the uh, day period uh, picture. Uh, uh, the AC is well formed. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, this is the 11-day period, the, uh, uh, and uh, this is the post of the 30-day 30, uh, 30 image showing the... Uh, uh, Pooja, uh, your uh, time is up, so you okay. just might have to conclude. Okay. Uh, thank you. I have a few questions. Uh, did you do the standing in this case? Yeah. And examination of lid? Did you avert the upper lid and check for any concretions or anything? No, sir, it was normal. Uh, it was normal. There was no concretion or something. Okay. And staining? Staining was uh, negative. Which staining? Uh, Which stain you have used? Chloracine. Why not? It means the other one? test was negative. Hello? And yes. why have you given Dimox tablet in this case? Um, because the pressure was higher, uh, pressure was on, uh, on uh, we did the non-contact tonometry, uh, it was, uh, the reading was not coming in the right time. Uh, reading um, is not coming, the answer that the pressure was high. Because uh, the patient also <laughs> had the desmetosis. It may be uh, corneal uh, surface disorder. Uh, sorry. Uh, if you are not able to do NCT, you have something digital also sir uh, we have we have avoided it because uh, there uh, there uh, uh, there was a chances of the perforation of the ulcer and uh, uh, because uh, in order to what avoid what is prognosis of this case in order to avoid the corneal perforation what is prognosis in this case uh, after your treatment will it be okay or it will progress um, uh, the patient is working fine. We, we no, I am saying the prognosis in future. Uh, we uh, we talk with the patient later on also. He he was telling no, that the no no what would happen down the line? Do you think whatever you did would be a long term solution or there could be a deviation from it? Okay. Anyway, I think we've exceeded the time. Uh, your documentation was amazing. Very well documented and very well presented as well. Uh, Anything. What is the dose of Dimox? Two you had given one tablet two. Yes, sir. 250 per day. milligrams. How many times a day? 250. Uh, means one. It is normally... Two times. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, good. Uh, thanks. So next we have with us uh, Dr. Nishi. Okay, and she'll be talking about Aniradia and all that comes with it. A very good evening to the esteemed judges and my fellow delegates. I am Dr. Nishi Satish from Sabzajang Hospital. Today I'll be presenting a case of a 19-year-old male who is a resident of Delhi. He came with the chief complaints of diminution of vision since childhood. He had diminution of vision in both eyes. He noticed it since the age of four to five years. He also had a history of difficulty in adjusting to sunlight since childhood, involuntary repetitive eye movement since childhood, and he noticed the difficulty in reading since school. When uh, on prompting, he gave a history of colored halos. It was noticed uh, in the last three months. And he has no history of any trauma or systemic associations. His past history, family history, personal history. Past history revealed uh, cataract surgery with IOL implantation in the right eye four years back, but he didn't have any documents for this. On uh, family history, his father did have similar repetitive eye movement complaints, but he was not examined, so we could not make a good pedigree chart of that. His personal history was completely within normal limits. His general physical examination was within normal limits, including the stature of this patient. Systemic examination was thoroughly done to look for the CVS, CNS, per abdominal respiratory system, which were all within normal limits, especially emphasizing on the cerebellar functions. On ocular examination, The patient's head posture was normal, facial symmetry maintained, extraocular muscles uh, movements were full and free. He had a pendular nystagmus of both eyes. 
it was large amplitude conjugate with medium frequency and it was aggravated on attempting to focus on a char uh, on a target with no null point uh, his visual acuity was decreased it was 6 by 24 in the right eye and 6 by 60 in the left eye not improving uh, best corrected visual acuity and retinoscopy was poor because uh, of nystagmus and a good reflex was not seen near vision was also decreased contrast sensitivity was relatively decreased color vision was within normal limits on an, uh, on anterior examination iop was increased 28 mmhg in the right eye 29 mmhg in the left eye and uh, it is to be noted that the cornea was clear with a good tear breakup time corneal diameters were within normal limits on anterior chamber examination, we can see uh, thin iris tissue appreciate in, appreciated in the periphery on high magnification, both in the right and left eyes. In the right eye, a three-piece uh, posterior chamber IOL was seen in the bag uh, with a fibrose anterior capsular excess margin, which helped us uh, determine that it was in the bag. In the left eye, we can see thin iris tissue in the periphery, superiorly subluxated lens with anterior subcapsular cataract and taut inferior zonules. On gonioscopy with a two meter gonio lens, this was uh, uh, what was seen according to the Schaefer grading system. The inferior angles were relatively open compared to the uh, nasal, temporal, and superior. This is a Becker's goniogram depicting what I have seen on gonioscopy, showing that the inferior angles were relatively open while the other angles were narrower. This is an image of the uh, left eye of the patient showing an anterior subcapsular cataract with a superiorly subluxated lens and taut zonules, inferiorly. This is the right eye of the patient where we can see a three-piece uh, IOL in the bag, anterior capsular excess margin is seen. This is a gonioscopy image. A good image could not be taken because the patient had uh, nystagmus. Superior angle of the right eye showed a pigmented trabecular meshwork. A thin iris root is visible in both the eyes. On fundus examination, we could see that uh, there was asymmetric cupping of 0.1 in uh, both eyes and nasalization of vessels as well as bayonetting was present. A sharp foveal reflex could not be seen in this patient. So this is my case summary of the above findings. We also noted the axial length of 24 mm in, the, uh, in both eyes. Diagnosis is uh, bilateral eye congenital aniridia with foveal hypoplasia and nystagmus with secondary developmental glaucoma. Left eye, there's a superiorly subluxated cataractus lens secondary to congenital aniridia, and right eye pseudophakia. The differential diagnosis in these cases, it can be isolated aniridia, it can be associated with Wagger syndrome, or it can be associated with Gillespie syndrome. We have all these pending investigations, uh, OCT macula and FFA for foveal hypoplasia, CCT, OCT, ONH, ES, OCT, visual field analysis, which were all poor because the patient uh, had nystagmus. Routine investigations were within normal limits and we have to keep note that this is a multidisciplinary ap approach. Treatment, finally, we have to give IOP lowering, aniridia treatments, subluxated cataract lens has to be extracted since there's more than seven clock hours of subluxation and we have to monitor this patient further for dry eye and symptoms of aniridia associated keratopathy. Thank you. Good, better. That was uh, very nicely presented. So, what are the medications that you have given? So, uh, for IOP lowering, we tried medical treatment, but it was not controlled with medical treatment. And it is seen in aniridia. There might be a congenital dysgenesis of the trabecular meshwork. It will not respond well to uh, medical management. So, this has to be surgic. This has to be surgically managed uh, in this case. In fact, glaucoma drainage devices are uh, preferred over the tra conventional trabeculectomy in these cases. So in cases, uh, was a specular microscopy done? Uh, specular was not done in this case, sir. It should have been done because we have to assess the uh, corneal function in this case as limbal cell, uh, stem cell deficiency can be present in. Okay. Got it. Differential diagnosis of uh, superior subluxation. Uh, lens, yes. yes, sir. Supi uh, superior temporal subluxation can be seen in Marfan syndrome. So uh, we did ask this patient about um, hyperlaxity of joints, which he did not have. And the stature of the patient was within normal limits. He did not have an increased arm span or increased height. And thumb, thumb sign, etc., were negative. We did try to uh, 
uh, see the Gantz criteria, there was nothing which was suge suggestive of Marfan syndrome. Why pendulum nystagmus? Uh, pendulum nystagmus in this case must be, sec uh, must be secondary to uh, foveal hypoplasia. It's secondary nystagmus. So it will present with an finger. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Dr. Charu Mago with, uh, is Dr. Charu here? So good evening, everyone. So I'm Dr. Charu, and I'm going to present a rare case of association of choroidal coloboma with retinitis pigmentosa. So I'm presenting history and examination findings of a male patient who is aged 16 years, hailing from Jalandhar. He presented to OPD on 9th June 2022 with the chief complaints of diminution of vision since four years in both eyes. So patient was apparently well four years back when he noticed a gradual, painless, progressive diminution of vision in both eyes. There was no history of trauma or surgery in his eyes. Unaided visual equity documented as 618 and 636 in right and left eye respectively, which improved to 612 in right eye with a spherical correction of minus two with a cylinder of minus five, and uh, corrected to 618 in left eye with a correction of minus two and minus 5.5 at 180 degree cylindrical power in left eye. There was no history of any systemic illness, no history of similar complaints in family. IOP by NCT was recorded as 11 and 8 mm in right and left eye respectively. Ocular examination, both eyes showed fine nystagmus, normal conjunctiva, clear cornea, normal AC def, normal patterned iris, round pupil with both direct and consensual reflex present and a clear lens. So posterior segment in right eye, it showed that vitreous was clear, optic disc was not visible, macula showed the normal uh, fundus reflex, and retina showed inferior coloboma with Edamins type 2 and Gopalitol type 5 classification. Retinal periphery showed the bony spicules and attenuated blood vessels. So this was the fundus picture of right eye of this patient, which is clearly uh, showing the uh, choroidal coloboma as only the superior border of the uh, optic disc is visible, so this is the Edamins type 2 and Gopalitol type 5 of choroidal coloboma, and it was associated with retinal uh, vessels could be seen attenuated, and it is surrounded by these bony spicules, which is the characteristic findings of the retinitis pigmentosa, so this could be appreciated in right uh, fundus picture of the patient. The posterior segment of the left eye also showed the similar image that uh, the Edamins type 2 of uh, uh, choroidal coloboma could be appreciated. The vessels are seen attenuated and uh, uh, the bony spicules are seen surrounding these vessels, uh, making a diagnosis of the retinitis pigmentosa with choroidal coloboma. Uh, OCT, is, uh, uh, sh uh, OCT in right eye is showing the uh, abnormal retinal contour with an inferior dip in the area of the choroidal coloboma. Similarly, in left eye, the choroidal coloboma is well appreciated uh, with the abnormal contour of the retina. So diagnosis of a posterior segment choroidal coloboma type 2 edamens and type 5 gopalitol classification with retinitis pigmentosa in both eyes was made. Now why this case is special? Uh, it's because the ocular pathologies which till date have been associated with retinitis pigmentosa are posterior subcapsular cataract, myopia, glaucoma, keratoconus, vitreous detachment with intermediate uveitis, and optic distrusions. A study done by Parmigiani in 2004, they reported a series of three adult siblings which have phenotypically different retinitis pigmentosa with macular coloboma, which was autosomal dominant clinical entity. A similar study uh, was done in uh, United States where they reported a single case of unilateral coloboma in association with retinitis pigmentosa. Palvi Agarwal in 2013 reported a single case of unilateral coloboma in association with retinitis pigmentosa. And Devi Bharti Dugal in just 2020, they reported a first case of retinitis pigmentosa with association of iridofundal coloboma. So there is no other case report which ever showed the choroidal coloboma bilaterally in association with retinitis pigmentosa. 
So uh, both these findings, the retinitis pigmentosa and choroidal coloboma, they could be the separate entities which are occurring together in this case, or it could be a rare association of choroidal coloboma with typical retinitis pigmentosa. So we need to report the similar case or case series to come to a conclusive result. Although this association which is reported here is the first of its kind to be reported in the ophthalmic literature, which makes this case a rare association. Thank you. What do you understand by coloboma, choroidal coloboma? Sir, uh, it's and a development. How does it develop? Sorry. It's a developmental. Uh, so what happens, development? Uh, uh, sir, um, the, uh, the developmental of how does coloboma actually develop? Complete coloboma, incomplete coloboma. So there has to be some genesis. Yes, sir. Uh, Everybody does not get it. So developmental, what developmental normally is taking place in this particular case? And complications of, of in future, what can happen with the coloboma? So in this case, particularly since it's a, a choroidal coloboma, it's a, it has been linked to a retinal detachment could occur. There could be uh, this nidus for this uh, uh, development of detachment is either within the coloboma or outside it or the ridge between the, uh, the two, which could be hence um, leading to retinal detachments uh, most frequently. Okay, we'll change track and I'll say that if this kind of pigmentation bone speculi of pigmentation was seen only in one eye. Okay. What would you have thought of? The other eye was, had coloboma, but uh, no uh, RP kind pigmentation. What else would you think of? Uh, PP, RC, uh, in uh, paravenous retinal. So uh, bone speculi like pigmentation, uh, okay. especially, and, and you mentioned it partly, yes. uh, can happen if there is a spontaneous reattachment of retina. Yes, sir. So that's one of the differentials. So yes, sir. Sir. What type of glaucoma do we develop in these cases? Anyway, good presentation, Charu. I think okay, thank you. we call it a day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Gautam. Good evening, everyone. I'll be presenting my case, that is macular hole closure with anterior lens capsular flap leading to severe macular fibrogliosis. My mentor is Dr. Shreyas. So our case is a 68-year-old gentleman who presented with left eye gradual onset painless progressive diminution of vision for six months. The best corrected visual acuity in right eye was 69 and in left eye it was 260. After working up the patient, we arrived at a diagnosis of left eye full thickness macular hole. Uh, this is uh, the OCT at presentation showing full thickness macular hole with a macular hole index of 0.27. If you notice, the basal diameter of the macular hole is 1503 microns, which is quite large. So we managed this case by left eye parse plana vitrectomy with internal limiting membrane peeling with internal inverted internal limiting membrane flap with SF6 injection. No closure of the macular hole was seen even after two weeks of prone positioning. The patient also developed posterior subcapsular cataract. So this is the fundus photo at four weeks after inverted internal limiting membrane flap surgery showing persistent macular hole. And this is the corresponding OCT image. So the diagnosis at the end of six weeks of initial surgery was left eye posterior subcapsular cataract with failed macular hole surgery. So subsequently, uh, we did the following for the patient. We did left eye phaco emulsification. The video currently shows anterior continuous curvilinear capsular excess and we harvested the anterior lens capsule. Then we did nucleus removal cortex removal and IOL placement. This was followed by re plana vitrectomy and near total FAE. Now the harvested anterior lens capsule is stain stained with trifan blue. 
then we used the ILM forceps to cover the macular hole with the anterior capsular flap and we used a soft tip cannula to cover it then FAA completion was done and SF6 was injected so 10 days after the second surgery that is 10 days after the lens capsular flap surgery this is the OCT which shows closed macular hole with overlaying capsular flap this is the fundus photo three weeks after the lens capsule surgery showing macular fibrogliosis noted at the site of capsular flap placement and this is the corresponding OCT image the BCVA at this stage was 660 so these are the serial OCT images of our patient this is 10 days post op OCT showing closed macular hole and capsular flap this is three weeks post operatively showing severe gliosis this is two months post operatively showing that the gliosis has slightly increased and this is three months post operatively showing that the gliosis is still persistent and the best corrected visual acuity was maintained at 660 coming to the discussion parse plana vitrectomy with internal limiting membrane peeling is the surgery of choice for macular hole in 88 to 100 percent of the cases hole closure is achieved the mechanism is that internal limiting membrane peeling eliminates tangential traction on the fovea and bridges the gap between the hole edges with muller cell contributed repair <coughs> persistent macular hole following surgery can occur when the diameter of the hole is more than 400 microns or when the macular hole index is less than 0.5 so this slide shows the various macular hole indices for prognostication the most important one is MHI which is given by height by basal diameter which in our case was 0.27 which is a bad prognostic marker for hole closure so what are the treatment options for persistent macular hole for persistent macular holes various surgical options include inverted ILM flap lens capsular flap autologous ILM graft from adjacent retina autologous retina and autologous blood such transplanted tissues act as a scaffold for migration and proliferation of activated cells which produce neurotropic factors accelerate wound healing process at macula and closes the macular hole in our case the probable causes for macular fibrogliosis are proliferation of lens capsular cells just like anterior capsular phimosis or posterior capsular opacification and the second hypothesis which we put forward is it can be because of an exaggerated allergic inflammatory response to a foreign tissue placed on retina just like the reaction seen with lens matter in vitreous that is fake on anaphylaxis these are my references thank you so what is your take home message um, uh, when um, we have to prognosticate uh, macular holes uh, before uh, operating and we have to uh, uh, counsel the patients accordingly uh, in our case uh, initial surgery anatomy closure was not could not be achieved uh, with three surgery anatomy closure was achieved and uh, best corrected visual acuity improved from 260 to 660 what is function of ILM internal um, normal not in the macular hole So well, when you are removing uh, ILM, some function will be deprived. So what is normal function of ILM? It's a so what, uh, uh, how many cases have been reported where uh, they used anterior lens capsule for macular hole closure? Uh, uh, literature, uh, when I reviewed the literature, there were around uh, six cases. So is there any specific post-operative regime that you follow? Because as you said, there is a high chance that there might be a reaction and that would lead to all this glasses and all. So Sir, as such, the reaction is not uh, harmful. So uh, the routine post-operative care will be followed. Uh, the main aim in our case is anatomy closure. No, uh, that's fine. But to, I mean, if at all, if you say that it was because of reaction, uh, is it described in literature that you have to give extra dose of steroids or intravenous uh, steroids? No, sir. No, no need for extra dose of steroids because uh, uh, gliosis is uh, expected. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank right. you. Dr. Priyanka Mishra. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Priyanka Mishra. My topic for presentation is regression rate following treatment in type 1 ROP with laser versus bevacizumab. 
So we all know ROP is a major cause of preventable childhood blindness worldwide. It is a vision-threatening vasoproliferative disorder affecting right now premature infants four to five weeks after birth who have avascular or incompletely vascularized retina. Now zones of ROP with center at optic disc, two disc diameter forming a circle com comprises zone one, extending from the edges of zone one to the nasal ora serrata and cor corresponding area temporally co uh, is zone two and the residual temporal retina is zone three. The stages, uh, the demarcation line seen between the vascular and avascular retina is stage one. If the line achieves a width and the height, it is uh, ridge and it is uh, called stage two. The extra retinal fibrovascular proliferation at the ridge is stage three. Uh, subtotal RD uh, is stage four. At extra foveal region is 4A and that the fovea is 4B. And the total RD is stage five. Now treatment option, observation and uh, repetitive uh, screening is done in type two ROP while uh, laser is given in type one ROP. Uh, intravitreal anti vegf injections are given in AROP with severe plus disease, non-dilating pupil, and dense iris neovascularization, vitreous hemorrhage, patients unfit for laser, and in uh, those who are, the regression is not seen with laser. So this is a retrospective interventional study at GMC Amritsar, uh, where medical records of preterm infants screened, diagnosed with type one ROP and treated with either uh, bevacizumab or laser were recorded between uh, November 2022 and December 2020 and December 2022. Uh, all neonates less than or equal to 35 weeks of gestation and birth weight uh, less than or equal to 200,000 grams were uh, enrolled in the study. Neonates with type one ROP were divided into two groups based on treatment received, the laser group and the intravitreal bevacizumab group. And the status of retina at the time of last dilated fundus examination was noted for each patient. Uh, the primary outcome uh, were recorded as persistent or regression of the disease and uh, those who failed with failed treatment uh, again uh, were retreated and secondary outcome was uh, recorded similarly. Now observations and results, in my study reported 73% of the babies with uh, ROP, 186 eyes of those uh, were diagnosed with type one ROP, out of those 140 eyes received laser and the rest 46 were given intravitreal bevacizumab. Uh, now zone sev uh, disease severity, uh, uh, in the laser group, uh, 32 eyes were having zone one disease while 108 were zone two. In the bevacizumab, nine had zone one disease while 37 had zone two disease, which was found statistically significant, uh, while plus or pre-plus was not found statistically significant. Most common stage treated was zone three. Now retreatment history, uh, 24 eyes in the RLP group were again given re uh, laser and 19 were given bevacizumab. In the IVB group, 12 eyes which, showed uh, which uh, did not show regression were given uh, laser. Uh, seven eyes in home treatment failed with bevacizumab and again relaser done, but progression was uh, seen uh, and they were referred to higher centers. Now treatment outcome, 86% of the eyes showed regression with laser, while 76% uh, showed regression with bevacizumab, and this difference was found statistically significant. Uh, the overall incidence of ROP is found to be 72.6% in my study. 121 eyes of 140 showed regression post-RLP, while 34 eyes of uh, 46, 34 of 46 eyes uh, showed regression with intravitreal bevacizumab. In my study, laser was found to be significantly effective in treatment of type one ROP when compared with intravitreal bevacizumab. Uh, while in a study with, uh, by Rupihar R et al, both laser and intravitreal bevacizumab were equally effective treatment for type one ROP. However, in another study by Nicora SD et al, uh, AROP was found to be, uh, in AROP babies, anti vegf was found to be significantly better. So I will conclude by saying ROP continues to be the leading cause of visual morbidity worldwide and its uh, incidence is increasing in developing countries. Effective uh, screening and timely intervention can result in better visual and structural outcome in ROP. Both laser, photocoagulation and anti vegf treatment are known to regress the disease with laser being more effective. Uh, these are my references. Thank you. So uh, effectively, uh, very nice uh, presentation, Prinka. And uh, effectively, uh, ideally, we should give 
uh, if you're comparing two groups, they should be equally matched in everything else, and then only in one you would give laser, in one you'll give. Yes, uh, were they matched in uh, all? Yes, sir, the demographic profiles, the risk factors, both uh, neonatal, maternal, uh, they were matched, and they were not found to be statistically significant. No, no, in the zone ROP of ROP levels. Zone of ROP and stage. Zone of ROP. Stage and zone, because the prognostication is different for all of these. So what sir is trying to say is that you would not know whether your laser worked or maybe anyway carried a better prognosis. Okay. So generally, uh, any treatment has to be done for exactly same uh, stage and zone. So we type 1 ROP, uh, like uh, those. Which anti-VEGF was used in this case and what sir, was the intra, dose? Uh, sir, map, sir, Avastin. Dose Avastin. 0 0.06 to 5. Did you find any uh, any new study? This was a retrospective analysis till 2022. Yes. Anything else did you find where, not between laser and Evastin, but anything else which has been Sir, studied? studies have been done between injection ranibizumab and uh, bevacizumab. Uh, so there are very, uh, so many studies comparing laser and uh, bevacizumab. So as a message, uh, which cases, let us say there's a zone one ROP, where would you like to do if everything is so where will you do the uh, injections? So injection? Yeah, if the baby can get laser, would you do a laser or one can go ahead and just do an injection? So if the uh, so baby can get laser? Yeah, well, so there is no contraindication to that. So in AROP cases, mostly we'll go with uh, uh, injections. And the rest, all you can go ahead and do lasers. Sir, if uh, like pupil is dilated, iris new vascularization not seen in all those cases, uh, media is clear, we can if go. If somebody doesn't have a laser, what can they do? So they can still go with uh, bevas uh, injections. It they will don't, suppose they don't want an injection, what else can you do? What was being done before the lasers were available? So, uh, Come on. Stero Cryo ke naam suna? Cry yes, sir. Cryotherapy. Chalo. Okay, very good, bete. Chalo. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Anushree. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Anushree from SDM Medical College, Karnataka. I want to present a, a rare of case of a sudden vision loss. Um, so a 25-year-old Indian young gentleman came to us with sudden painless vision loss over um, two days ago. And uh, his, uh, he had similar complaints in uh, both the eyes uh, alternatively in a year ago before he presented to us. And it was uh, transient and uh, he had a past history of uh, sub subarachnoid hemorrhage in uh, June of 2017, a left midbrain infarct in Feb of 2017, a led left medullary infarct in Feb of 2015, and a right uh, lateral medullary infarct in Jan of 2013. Uh, and he also has a positive family history where his younger brother died at the age of 13 years due to a massive abdominal hemorrhage resulting from a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, and he had multiple uh, small vessel aneurysms throughout his body in the brain and ab including the brain and abdomen. So my patient uh, uh, coming to his examination, um, eyeball position was orthophoric. In his right eye, he was PL negative um, and uh, intraocular pressure of 16. Anterior segment examination was uh, normal with the normal limits except for the RAPD that was present. Coming to the distant direct ophthalmoscopy, a yellow glow was seen and uh, the disc was uh, edematous in the right eye along with the macula which showed a cherry red spot and uh, there was generalized narrowing of at arterial cattle tracking of the inferior, along the inferotemporal quadrant vein and the retina was pale. His, uh, sorry, his left eye examination, uh, he had a BCVA of 6.6 6 and uh, the rest, uh, anterior segment and posterior segment examination uh, of his left eye was uh, within normal limits. Uh, this was the fundus picture in his right eye and left eye. So this was the right eye fundus and left eye fundus. It's very clear that it is a right eye CRAO or a central retinal artery occlusion. 
but what is interesting about this case was he was a 25 year old young man and we investigated thoroughly and he was found that he um, uh, there he was ANA positive and anti rho antibodies positive and lupus anticoagulant uh, coagulant positive. So initially when he presented to us with sudden vision loss, he did not reveal any of the reports, old reports or old past history. Only after digging into it and repeated questioning and uh, asking for him to go home and get his reports, did, he, did we come to know that he was already worked up and he was a defaulter of whatever disease and whatever treatment that he was receiving. So uh, teaming up with our rheumatologist, uh, we did the further workup. So this was an MRI that uh, the first MRI showed a right uh, medullary infarct uh, previously in 2013. And uh, this MRI shows a acute hematoma uh, in the left anterior temporal region in 2017. So uh, the diagnosis um, was right eye central, art uh, central retinal artery occlusion secondary to a vasculitis and it was associated with a um, syndrome called as the deficiency of adenosine D-aminase 2. Um, why we came to this uh, diagnosis is because his brother, who, who died at the age of uh, 13 years, had multiple aneurysms in his body, and when the genetic testing was done for him, they found this particular gene, uh, this syndrome, and, uh, and his, uh, this, my patient also had similar clinical pictures, so they did not do a genetic condition since the patient was not affordable, and they concluded it as a DADA2 syndrome since he had all the clinical manifestations similarly. So we need, what I want to tell is that a CRAO in a young patient is never a, the, uh, it doesn't happen without any underlying cause. So it usually, it's, um, and this is one of the very rare syndromes. In the world, there are only 300 reported cases, although the prevalence can be like a one in 300,000. Um, so it's a only a described molecularly mono, uh, monogenic vasculitis syndrome, where um, the ADA2, it occurs on the um, 22, uh, 22nd chromosome. Um, so there can be two types of ADA. As we all know, during our MBBS days, we would have studied the ADA1 deficiency causes uh, severe combined immunodeficiency. While this is the ADA2, which uh, what happens is this ADA2 is, uh, it is uh, present in myeloid cells and all um, um, bone marrow precursor cells. And this uh, normally it converts adenosine to de deoxyadenosine. So when this enzyme is deficient, the adenosine levels increase. It causes activation of the myeloid uh, ce uh, range of uh, cells, which uh, like macrophages, which causes the activation of the neutrophils to relieve uh, inflammatory markers like mainly the tumor necrosis factor alpha. And this mainly causes stripping of the uh, endothelium of the blood vessels. So uh, they arrange, they come with various uh, systemic manifestations. You might have to uh, conclude. Yes, sir. Uh, but ocular manifestations has not been reported previously, and this was uh, one, I've, it's not, we haven't yet uh, report, uh, I mean, published this, but this is our, uh, one of the ocular manifestations, and the treatment is anti-TNF-alpha antibody, which is adalimumab. All right. So basically, uh, good take home message that CRO and Young, you, your antenna should be up. It can be a cardiac event or it can be a systemic event like a vasculitis, vasculitis. associated with a lot of known or unknown uh, factors. What, I mean, is there anything else that he could have done to prevent since he already had multiple infarct in the past? Yeah, um, what treatment was prescribed at that time? So he received the same, the only treatment is this adilimumab, sir, which is anti TNF uh, alpha antibody. Um, that's the only treatment which the patient has to take uh, every month lifelong. So uh, he was initially given on that and then he defaulted and he uh, sought to some uh, alternative medicine. So then when he came back to us with sudden vision loss, we again gave a uh, course of uh, so, uh, so IVMP, that is methyl prednisolone, one gram for three days. And then initially for three months, it's bi-weekly, the adalimumab. And then it's monthly lifelong. But, uh, I recently spoke to my rheumatologist and the patient defaulted again and uh, sadly passed a few months ago due to a massive brain hemorrhage. I was just about to ask you what's the prognosis for life. Yeah, because uh, we had tied him up with an NGO to receive the same medication, uh, but even then they sought to alternative medicine. Right, thank you. Yes, uh, Ashwita. Uh, 
A very good evening to everyone present here. Today I'll be presenting a rare case of Miller-Fisher syndrome, which is a variant of GB syndrome. So we had a little girl, three years old, whose informant was the mother, who came with the history of fever 15 days back, cough 10 days back, vomiting 10 days back, and complete restriction of extraocular movement since five days. The child was apparently all right 15 days back, but it had an episode of fever which came and went with medications. It was associated with cough and also had two to three episodes of vomiting which was containing food particles. What was striking was the parents noticed that one morning the child woke up with complete restriction of ocular movements in both the eyes. They also give a history that she had clumsiness of movements while walking since one week. There was, however, no diurnal variations in her symptoms. We digged into the clinical history to rule out other cranial nerve involvement and any intracranial pathologies. Uh, she did not have any similar complaints in the past. She did not receive any recent uh, vaccinations and no such history in the family as well. The child was conscious, well-oriented to time, place, and person, and moderately built. All her vitals were within normal limits. We went on to doing a head-to-toe -to -toe examination and found that uh, all the uh, other sim uh, there were no clinical signs. However, the ocular symmetry and facial symmetry was also normal. Pertaining to the ocular examination, her visual acuity for distance was 6 by 9 and for near was N6. There were uh, small subconjunctival hemorrhages noted in both the eyes. Other than that, in both the eyes, the adenexal structures were within normal limits. The pupils was 2 mm in size, briskly reactive to both direct and indirect light reflex with no RAPD on swinging flashlight. The posterior segment was evaluated by a distant direct ophthalmoscopy and also by indirect ophthalmoscopy and the disc, macula, blood vessels and background were within normal limits. The extraocular movements was completely restricted in all the nine gazes. MRD1 in both the eyes was 4 mm and MRD2 was 5 mm in both the eyes. But kuch to different hai na ye case mein. So what was it? The ataxic gait. We saw that while the child was walking, there was a different gait. So we went on to doing a CNS examination. The higher mental functions were within normal limits. Third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve was completely involved. However, the other cranial nerve uh, uh, was completely normal. The motor system evaluation showed that the tone and power was in, within normal limits. The superficial reflexes in both upper limb and lower limb was normal. There was a reflexia uh, in the lower limb examination in the knee, ankle, and the plantar reflexes. The sensory system was preserved. There were no particular cerebellar signs and no meningeal signs as well. We went on to doing an MRI brain to look for any intracranial pathology. The uh, axial section showed that the, D, the DW1, uh, DWI images and the flare images showed no significant pathology. An MRI spine was done and few signal, subtle signal intensity changes were seen from C2 to C7 level. So once we did this, we got a neurologist opinion done. We were thinking of suspicion of multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, Miller-Fisher syndrome, and we did a couple of blood investigations. Her anti-MOG was negative, anti-acetylcholine rece uh, receptor was negative, and with a strong clinical suspicion as she had the triad of symptoms, we suspected her to have a Miller-Fisher variant of GVS and was started on IV immunoglobulin, one gram per kg per day for two days. At sixth day of the admission, we noticed that her uh, gait slightly improved. However, the extraocular movements were still restricted and she continued to have a reflexia. So this was our little champion on discharge. To summarize, this uh, five-year-old girl who was immunized up till date had an upper respiratory tract infection, came with a triad of symptoms, and this suggested that she had Miller-Fisher syndrome. This was her at... Uh, three weeks after her uh, course and she was discharged and you can see a great improvement in her gait. Her extraocular movements in the left eye were almost normal and in her right eye, other than the lateral movements, other restriction did de decrease. So GBS syndrome is, occurs approximately only in one to two individuals in a one lakh population and Miller-Fisher variant occurs in 5% of GBS syndrome as rare as one to two cases in one million population. 
so what do you take home from this is it is a very rare variant however it can occur in all the age groups usually more in the males than females two of the symptoms that are out, are out of the triad of symptoms is what you have to look for thank you so uh, why why was mog done anti mog you said uh, she had uh, subtle changes in the mri spine so and they uh, since the she we went on to go doing an mri contrast to rule out if any multiple sclerosis or demyelinating lesions was present uh, but however uh, that, that what what are the mri features of mog uh, in multiple sclerosis mog, mog and multiple sclerosis are different there would be demyelinating uh, lesions where in the uh, sp uh, spinal sections in, and the all right uh, so uh, uh, what is the first name of miller what is the first name of fisher i don't know. you you said it actually you miller have a slide Fish. last slide actually there was a one person yeah, charles the miller fisher right there are no two people <laughs> now but very good good very good documentation and one take home message is that once a child comes with that acute why why it is important for us to be involved in this and to diagnose is that these patient can easily progress to respiratory uh, distress diabare syndrome where it can actually go quite south it can they can it can involve the respiratory center patient can be put on ventilator as well so you have to be prompt a lot of time apart from immunoglobulin uh, these patients also may require plex. plasma pheresis yes. thank you sir uh, dr dimple good evening everyone i am dimple thakkar from uh, institute of ophthalmology aligarh muslim university so today uh, i am presenting a peculiar case uh, which is an unusual proptosis so my uh, patient was a 7 year old child from uttar pradesh who presented with forward protrusion of right eye since 3 years which was insidious in onset painless non progressive in nature and which was followed by a trivial trauma uh, he also had swelling of left arm since 6 months the swelling was gradual in onset slowly progressive and associated with intermittent pain of moderate intensity while his uh, left eye was all absolutely normal and he did not have any complaints of uh, in the right eye he did not complain of any diplopia or any painful ocular movements or any rise of uh, temperature Uh, neither did he complain of any uh, sudden rise of the swelling or variation with the uh, position then coming to the general and systemic examination everything was normal except that uh, on musculoskeletal examination we found there was a diffuse swelling of firm consistency which was present over the lower side of the left arm and there were multiple bony defects which was palpated on the skull uh, then uh, blood investigations were sent uh, which was within normal limits except that the hemoglobin was 9.8 suggestive of anemia the birth history past history and personal history were not contributory for this case coming to the significant ocular examination so the child had protrusion of the right eye the uh, there was vertical dystopia in the right eye uh, in the lower lid uh, retraction was present more in the right eye than the left eye there was a faint crease present in the right upper lid and on retropulsion test resistance was present in the right eye there was no lid lag or lag of thalamus in the right eye uh significant visual assessment uh, both uh, uh both the right and left eye the best corrected visual acuity was 66 with correction and the pressure was 14 and 18 respectively in the right and left eye the extraocular movements were full in all the cases and the pupillary reaction was uh, both the direct and indirect was uh, present in both the eyes so these are the uh, free, free and full movements of uh, ocular movements so uh, w uh on coming to the proptosis assessment the navziger view uh, and worms eye view we can see there was a protrusion proptosis of the right eye uh, hertel's exophthalmometer was done and keeping the base distance 84 mm the right eye was uh, measurement was found to be 22 mm and left eye was 16 v the vertical fissure height was 12 uh, the, the uh, mrd1 and mrd2 readings are as follows Uh, the slit lamp examination and the fundus examination both were within normal limits now coming to the left arm x ray view we found uh, expansile lytic lesion in the humerus as well as in the scapula 
uh, the X-ray skull of anterior, posterior, and lateral view, we also again later lesions of the skull, uh, which included the parietal bones as well as the uh, lateral wall of the orbit and the roof, and also the medial wall of the orbit. These are the 3D reconstruction images showing the same. Uh, axial scan of the CECT brain on the bone window showed uh, both the inner and outer table of the uh, skull involved. Uh, uh, the parietal bone and the greater wing of sphenoid was also involved. Uh, the MRI humerus, uh, the cor coronal section and the axial section uh, showed uh, expansile lytic lesion, uh, but it, it also had cystic area suggest, uh, which had hemorrhages, so it was suggestive of uh, some uh, oste telangiectatic osteosarcoma. So my provisional diagnosis was multifocal Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and the differential diagnosis is metastasis. So for confirming the diagnosis, we need a histopathological examination. Uh, so uh, we did the uh, examination from the lesion of the humerus, but it uh, showed just the degenerated bony tissue along with areas showing dead bone and hemorrhages. So the patient was called up for repeat biopsy from representative areas and further management would have been planned. But <laughs> unfortunately, we lost the patient to follow up. We lost, uh, uh, but, but the patient did not turn up for uh, further investigations. So my discussion, so uh, I conclude that my uh, cases, all the pediatric patients presenting with proptosis, they should undergo, uh, undergo a thorough examination and the possibility of an underlying malignancy should be considered even in cases with subtle signs. And it should be kept that LCH can one of be uh, the malignancies which can lead to proptosis. Thank you. Nice, very, very good conclusion. And obviously, unfortunately, you couldn't uh, document it. It could have been a really, uh, really clincher, but a nice presentation as well. Good point. All of you have presented very well and an excellent uh, collection of cases. It's a good learning for us also. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, 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 it's obviously it's a cliche to say that we found it very difficult to, to judge and that actually that's, that's, a, that's a fact. And it's very heartening uh, uh, when we keep the evolution of, when you look at the evolution of how the cases are presented in iFocus, I mean, over a period of last nine or 10 years, we have seen a dramatic improvement in the content, uh, documentation, the presentation style, and a lot of times, I mean, like nine or 10 years ago, we might have to actually tell the contestant that what you want to convey, or why you didn't document, why, where is the picture, where is the fundus, from there, to say that those questions are completely out of the window and we are just discussing the content. And that's, that's actually a testimony to the fact that uh, you guys have really done a, a great job. And uh, uh, one, one, obviously, uh, one suggestion is that please make sure that since this is a competition, there are, there are a few rules that one needs to follow. And one of the important rules is to stick to the time. A lot of times, uh, a great content does not win just because that particular uh, rule was breached. Uh, also, I mean, people who didn't present, this is a good platform to make sure that you, and make sure that you make a habit to present because that's how you improve your skill. When you prepare for even these presentations is where you acquire that skill to, to present and ultimately publish because that's what is going to help you in your, in your career. Look for, there was, in Hyderabad, in the first I focus, there was, there was a, a a case which one, and we still remember it, is where somebody who saw a corneal, repeated corneal ulcer from a particular region of Andhra Pradesh, he actually went to those, that region in Andhra Pradesh, spent two weeks there, spoke to the farmer, and found a new fungus which was causing that repeated corneal ulcer, patient, patients coming from the same region. So what I'm trying to say is that you don't have to have a fancy equipment uh, just to, to present these cases. I mean, it's just that keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, patients themselves, uh, uh, their condition is where we learn from if you, if you make sure that you keep your eyes and ears open. Fair enough. <laughs> so we will just, in, just bear with us for two minutes. Rolika is just uh, uh, 
tightening and uh, yeah, she's... Uh, it's really heartening the way you guys presented yeah. her. Uh, Rulika was always very <laughs> poor at math, so... <laughs> And like Rashmin rightly said, sometimes we were at a sea to what exactly to ask because, but do whenever you are uh, taking that thing up, like uh, just go a little deeper into it so that you know all the, like you're talking about the medicines, so what are the dosages of those medicines, what are the side effects, just, just a little, little bit, you know, so that at least you're thorough with the case that way. Yeah, actually, that, that's very important. When you come on stage with a case, we expect that you know more than us. You should, you should have had an all-round, because that, that's one topic that you probably studied for, for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. So that's something that, that should come through in five minutes, that uh, you documented it well, you did a good literature search, and you almost taught about that particular subject. Rolika calculator? So like Rashmin and uh, Dr. Parihar clearly said, all of you did very well. And, uh, but uh, well, uh, whatever, <laughs> you know, because of the numbers and the content sometimes, uh, Dr. Uh, Ashwetha Alba, she tops the table. <laughs> Dr. Shushmita comes second. And there is a joint third with Anushri and Charu. So come on stage. We'll just take a picture with all the with the judges. The awards will be given uh, on the award ceremony day on on Friday. However, the first person, yes, the the so uh, Dr. Ashwata qualifies directly for the I, uh, the star focus star of I focus. <laughs> I think I'm hypoglycemic now. <laughs> so so she qualifies directly for the star of I focus session. Okay, and uh, so please all of you come over. A nice picture. Yes. I, I. So good job everyone and this is the end of day one so we'll see you again tomorrow with some more enthusiasm so please go take a nice break okay have nice dinner enjoy the deli delicacies and we'll see you tomorrow okay see you thanks to the AB team thanks for working really hard I hope everything is in sync Thank you.